the Vice President Pan African Parliament, uh, representing the President of the Pan African Parliament, members of the Bureau of the Pan African Parliament, uh, the chairpersons of the permanent committees, chairpersons of major institutions present here, uh, dear colleagues, uh, honorable members of parliament from the six committees uh, represented here, uh, distinguished guests, all protocols observed, uh, good morning once again. It is with uh, great pleasure that uh, I address this August Continental Institution on the occasion of the joint seminar of the Committee on Trade, uh, Customs and Immigration Matters, and the African Union Labor Migration Advisory Committee in Africa. Uh, this joint seminar brings together six permanent committees of the Pan-African Parliament and will be held under the auspices of the Committee on Trade, uh, Customs, and Immigration Matters, uh, which I have the distinct honor of leading. On behalf of all the members present and on my own behalf, I welcome you all and wish you a pleasant stay in South Africa. It should be recalled that this seminar is being held at an important moment in the history of Pan-African Parliament, uh, whose activities had been suspended for almost two years due to the COVID-19, a global pandemic, and indeed the suspension of parliamentary functions in May last year. Uh, these challenges must serve as, a le as lessons, as well as uh, opportunity to put the institution back on the right track and to continue giving hope to the African peoples that we represent. Uh, congratulations and thanks to the President of the Pan-African Parliament, uh, Chief Fortune Charumbira, uh, for his outstanding leadership, and the members of the Bureau for their unwavering commitment to give a new dynamism to the Pan-African Parliament. My thanks also go to the Pan-African Parliament General Secretariat for ensuring all the prerequisites of, for the seminar uh, were in place, and indeed we were able to hold uh, the seminar today as planned. I cannot thank the host country enough for its legendary hospitality. Indeed, the joint seminar on bridging the gaps in the protection of migrant workers in Africa through advocacy for the use of legal instruments, focusing on the role of the Pan-African Parliament and the African Union Labor Migration Advisory Committee falls within the remit of the committee in accordance with Rule 26, uh, bracket three, of the Rules of Procedures of PAP uh, which states that uh, the Committee on Trade shall consider matters relating to the development of sound policy for cross-border, regional, and continental concerns within the areas of trade, customs, and immigration. This theme is revealing in many ways as the adequate protection of the rights of all migrants at the national level is essential and central to migration governance. At the national level, the implementation of international and um, continental and regional legal instruments on human rights and migration has been slow, uh, which constitutes a major gap in the protection of migrants. I hope that the collaborative work of the, co of the Committee on Trade and the, of the Committee on Trade and the African Union Labor Migration Advisory Committee will address the situation of those vulnerable groups. Indeed, the inputs and contribution of the other committees participating in the seminar will help enrich the discussions and the final outcome. To address the legal loopholes in labor protection, we review all existing legislation and amend accordingly. Honorable Vice President, representing the President of the Pan-African Parliament, members of the Bureau and of the Pan-African Parliament, Chairperson of the Permanent Committees, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, I'm hopeful that the, the, that the deliberations will be interactive, uh, fruitful, and the outcomes of the meeting, as outlined in the concept note, will be realized. I would like to, concede, uh, to conclude by appreciating the presence of the members of the Bureau of PAP and other dignitaries, and also wish everyone a successful seminar. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, with uh, those few remarks, I would like to take this opportunity to invite the African, the represented, uh, the, the African Union Commission, Mr. Sabelo Bokazi, Head of Division of Labor, Employment and Migration of the Department of Health, Humanitarian Affairs and Social Development to deliver his keynote address. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and allow me to stand here uh, since I'm not 
the member of parliament. Uh, to, we recognize the president, uh, Honorable Chief uh, Fortune Charumbira, but we also uh, recognize the, the vice president here representing the president. We also would like to recognize the bureau uh, with which uh, the president uh, works with. And we would, on behalf of the African Union, and the African Union Commission would like to congratulate them for being uh, elected recently uh, to, to lead this important AU organ. Also, I'd like to recognize you, Chair, um, Honorable uh, uh, Senator John Bideri, who is the chairperson of the PAP Committee on Trade, Customs, and Immigration Matters. Would also like to recognize our brother here, uh, Dr. Elvius, who is also the chair uh, of the Labor Migration Advisory Committee, but also uh, representing ECOWAS. Chairperson and honorable members, we also would like to recognize all the chairpersons of the other committees of this uh, joint sitting. And your excellencies, uh, honorable members, it is with a lot of gratitude and appreciation that the African Union Commission collaborates with the esteemed Pan-African Parliament uh, in this uh, joint sitting of six committees in order to discuss the fast evolving and growing labor migration policy discourse in Africa. Our sincerest gratitude goes to the Pan-African Parliament for great cooperation and creating uh, and for creating this opportunity for engaging the Commission, but also the Labor Migration Advisory Committee to deliberate on the protection and promotion of the rights of migrants and to accentuate the importance of the ratification and the domestication of the labor migration legal instruments. Chairperson, today's deliberation will reinforce the continental commitments in improving labor migration governance in Africa. We also take cognizance of the mandatory parliamentary legislative budget appropriation, constituent representation, and oversight roles, which are indispensable for follow through of the AU policy frameworks. The pioneering spirit of the AU galvanized Africa to singleness of purpose, a resolve to liberate Africa from the shackles of colonialism and apartheid. This set in stage for the formation of the African Union, which through its vision set Africa on a path to be an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful continent. Drawing inspiration from this AU's vision, the efforts towards integration and development are among the strong commitments renewed by African leaders at both regional and continental levels over the last decade, mainly through all policy frameworks and legal instruments, aiming at increasing growth and shared prosperity. Epistomized by development strategic aspirations for Africa, Agenda 2063 underscores the policy, the policy propositions in respect to employment, jobs, and decent work, social security, and social protection. In line with these goals and aspiration of Agenda 2063, the AU, in collaboration with partners, has taken a lead to fast-track continental integration through its flagship programs, including, among others, I will mention a few uh, chairperson and honorable members, the African Continental Free Trade Area, which seeks to bring to Africa, uh, to bring Africa into global trade environment as 
one continent, continent rather than as, an, in, uh, as individual countries. It aims to significantly accelerate growth in intra-Africa trade as a driver of economic growth and sustainable development and to strengthen Africa's common voice and policy space in global trade negotia negotiations to keep the jobs in Africa. The other flagship program and policy, uh, honorable members, is the free movement of people uh, protocol and an African passport, which aims to fast track continental integration by removing restrictions of Africans' ability to travel, work, and to live with their own, within their own continent. Excellencies, honorable members, apart from these flagship programs, the African Union Commission working with IOM and ILO is currently implementing a key program on governance and labor migration in Africa. The AU, ILO, IOM, UNECA joint program on labor migration governance for development and integration in Africa. This is known as the JLMP. So in our presentation, uh, Chairperson, you will hear more about the mention of this uh, abbreviation, JLMP. It stands for the Joint Program on Labor Migration Governance for Development and Integration in Africa. The JLMP was endorsed as an instrument dedicated to the implementation of the fifth key priority areas of the Declaration of Plan of Action and Employment Poverty Eradication, including development in Africa. Also, AU Wakatuku Plus 10 Declaration and Plan of Action and Employment Poverty Eradication and Inclusive Development in Africa adopted by the AU Assembly, Heads of State and Government in January 2015 and cut uh, in six key priority areas which is political leadership, accountability, and good governance, youth, women, and employment, social protection, and producti productivity, uh, sustainable and inclusive growth, well-functioning and inclusive labor market institutions, labor migration and regional economic integration, and partnership and resource mobilization. The JLMP has been working in various labor migration thematic areas, including supporting policy frameworks and legal instruments, improving technical capacity and cooperation at bilateral and regional levels, operationalizing the Labor Migration Advisory Committee and promoting tripartite social dialogue, research and labor migration and support to the development of regional labor and competency frameworks. This policy area on labor migration was necessitated by its importance as a global phenomenon, as well as the need to understand the dynamics around the countries of origin, the transit countries, as well as the countries of destination. Under JLMP, the Commission is also undertaking the operationalization of the Labor Migration Advisory Committee, which is usually referred to as the ELMAC, and uh, ECOWAS here is currently the chair of the ELMAC, which is established for tripartite consultation and practical coordination on labor migration and mobility at the continental level. The JLMP also supports ratification and domestication of key international standards on the protection of migrant workers, adoption and implementation of labor migration policy frameworks. Honorable members, increasingly, it is evident that Pan-African Parliament plays a key role in the achievement of the gender responsive and human rights, uh, human rights based labor migration architecture in the continent, including policy propositions advocated by African Union through the JLMP in supporting ratification as well as domestication 
of key instruments and standards on the protection of migrants, adoption of the, and the implementation of labor migration policy frameworks. The Commission, through the JLMP, plans to provide technical assistance to, to selected member states to develop their own national migration regulatory and policy frameworks, taking into consideration relevant international and regional human rights, legal instruments and policy frameworks. To achieve these goals, the, the Africa continent will continue to promote intra-Africa migration and mobility. Your Excellencies, as I conclude, I would like to take this opportunity to underscore that the Commission has observed with great concern the risk faced and the, the protection is, is needed for migrants, including migrant workers and members of, of their families with respect to labor exploitation, the full enjoyment of fundamental rights and the rights expressed in international labor standards are not adequately addressed. Migrants are already vulnerable uh, to, human, to human rights violations as well as not being uh, citizens of rece uh, receiving states and due, to, and, and due to their status, many often live and work in abusive and precarious situations. Through collaborative efforts of the AUC and Pan-African Parliament, we will continue to encourage member states to strengthen the protection, promotion, as well as safeguarding the universal human rights of labor migrants for all migrants and uphold the principle of equal treatment and opportunities as well as non-discrimination. We look forward to a continued warm working relations with the Pan-African Parliament, not only in labor migration, but on, on a number of also policy areas. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and we wish this uh, August House fruitful deliberation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sebelo Bokazi, for those very uh, important remarks uh, that address the theme of our meeting today. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to invite uh, the Labor Migration and Advisory Committee Chairperson uh, from ECOWAS, Dr. Alves uh, George, to make his keynote address. Uh, welcome, sir. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to deliver my speech in Portuguese. Ilustre Senhor Vice. Uh, 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 Your Excellency, Vice uh, uh, Chair of uh, PAP, uh, uh, dear from the Customs Trade and Customs uh, members of uh, PAP, uh, uh, dear representatives of uh, uh, Africa ECOWAS, members of ECOWAS, dear members of uh, the uh, dear members of the Pan African uh, the. African Union Labor Migration Advisory Committee. It is with great pleasure that I'm here uh, with you in this beautiful city of Johannesburg for this joint uh, hybrid seminar between the Pan-African Parliament and the African Union Labor Migratory Advisory Committee on how to approach the situation of uh, migrant workers, uh, women, and uh, children uh, on the use of legal instruments, the role of Pan-African Parliament and the African Union Labor Migratory Advisory Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, first and most of all, in the quality of a representative of His Excellency, Dr. Omar Ali Ture, uh, Chair of the CDO uh, Committee as President of the AU LMAC, I'd like to take this chance to thank the African Union, uh, the African uh, Parliament, Pan-African Parliament, and all partners, uh, GIZ, for their uh, immense contribution to make this seminar possible. I'd like to take this chance to, to thank and congratulate all interested parts and uh, those that host uh, this meeting, as well as the 
uh, South African government for the excellent facilities that have been provided for this very important occasion. Distinct ladies and gentlemen, guests, with uh, the EAU LMAC mandate uh, straightly aligned with the objectives of the GNLP and contributing for the uh, advocacy on the uh, migratory workers and align it with the African frameworks of the African Union and uh, as well as human international human rights uh, that are relevant to migrant workers and other uh, cooperation instruments we should actually mention here the set of meetings that we have had on these key issues that affect uh, if you like uh, migrant workers uh, in the informal uh, uh, sector, migration, mobility of professional uh, health workers and perspective of uh, laborer migrant uh, 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 key uh, aspects to be attained that were affected by COVID-19 and uh, all other institutions of uh, human rights and standards that are used to reinforce uh, the protection of uh, migrant workers and uh, respective families. The objective is to promote uh, dialogue uh, so that PAP can collaborate with AU LMAC to promote the protection of uh, migrant workers and touch base on the current status of discrimination of uh, uh, women and men that are migrant workers. And also, if you like, to uh, look at uh, the a Pan African or an African Union Labour Migrant Advisory Committee to build up partnership that includes all interested parts um, uh, who have their rights and duties related to the migration, civil society, the private sector, workers, and representatives of migrants, international partners that are key and priority for the effective advancement and uh, the human advancement of the needs, uh, uh, regional and continental uh, needs, including policies of uh, liberal governance that promote a, a coordinated and safe environment for migrant workers, and at the same time, uh, offering, if you like, protection of the most vulnerable migrant workers. In that sense, the objective of this meeting is extremely important because it will allow a discussion with PAP uh, as representatives of the African peoples on the modalities and cooperation strategies, uh, giving the uh, platform for uh, the mandates and incentives vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, the attainment of the objectives of GLNP and improving liberal uh, migration workers, uh, their rights, uh, uh, and covering all the gaps and deficits in the labor force uh, of these migrant workers, as well as uh, the pr social protection mechanisms. We should also deliberate on the best practices, critical uh, barriers and challenges, as well as identifying uh, inno innovative uh, solutions to increase ratification and domestication of uh, legal instruments that are relevant to this issue and also facilitate the advocacy and strengthening the capacity of PAP to improve liberal immigration uh, uh, instruments and uh, also, if you like, make legal Afri the legal instruments of the African Union visible on the labor uh, migrant workers. We hope that all the deliberations in this uh, issue will uh, help us attain the objectives of these initiatives and the results and the outcomes of this meeting will improve a better understanding of uh, PAP constituents and their understanding vis-a-vis -vis GNLP to actually uphold cooperation and advocacy of labor uh, migration and with a joint communique defending that the African uh, states, uh, African member states will better rectify uh, legal instruments to, for the protection of uh, migrant workers and relative uh, uh, members of uh, their families. And as such, to, if you like, to, to have the commitment of the ECOWAS member states to improve and harmonize all the Afri Uni African Union treats and respective uh, instruments vis-a-vis uh, labor uh, 
migrant workers and labor and their movements in Africa, but, and, and as such, develop the synergies within the legal instruments. Dear members of PUP, members of the uh, African Union Labor Migration Advisory Committee, uh, by thanking the South African uh, members of uh, the government for hosting this uh, meeting, as well as ELMAC and all uh, related parties. We hope that this workshop will be successful and with uh, fruitful deliberations, uh, with a coherent uh, cooperation in order to defend our interests and advance within uh, this issue. I do thank uh, deeply all the participants and I hope that we will have very, very good deliberations in this meeting. Thank you very much, all of you, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Alves, for the very important remarks. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to request um, Honorable Dotume Francois IV, uh, Vice President of the Pan African Parliament. Uh, who is also representing the chairperson of the president of the Pan-African Parliament to officially open uh, this uh, hybrid uh, meeting. Honorable sir. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is on behalf of the President of the Pan-African Parliament that I would set the floor at this hybrid seminar on filling the gaps between the migrant workers, female and male workers, and resort to legal instruments, the role of the Pan-African Parliament, and the African Union Advisory Committee on Migration, Labour Migration. Honourable members of the Pan-African Parliament, honourable chairpersons of the committees, representatives of institutions, representatives of the African Union Commission, dear colleagues, distinguished colleagues, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. It is for me a great honor to address you, to express my joy and satisfaction for the organization of this joint committee organized by the Committee on Trade, Customs and Migration on the sidelines of the statutory meetings, sittings of the committees of the Pan-African Parliament. I would like, first of all, to commend and encourage such an initiative that will be a good start for technical, dynamic cooperation between the Pan-African Parliament and the ELMAC on migration, labor migration issues. This laudable initiative held jointly by six permanent committees of the Pan-African Parliament uh, around this important issue on labor migration in the African continent should be, is also one of the merits of the Bureau of the Pan-African Parliament. Let me take this opportunity to congratulate and thank wholeheartedly the experts of the, of the African Union for their constant reliable, uh, availability to share their knowledge and expertise in order to build the managerial capacities of the MPs in various fields of competence. It would be a remiss of me not to mention the presence of the MPs, of the members present here, despite their busy schedules and the problems that they encounter each time they come here to the Pan-African Parliament. I'd like to address to you my encouragement and 
invite you to persevere in uh, this struggle because uh, the aspirations and expectations of our populations are huge. The Committee on Trade, Customs and Migration of the Pan-African Parliament and the Advisory Committee of the African Union Commission on Labour Migration have agreed on the need to organize a joint seminar on the theme to fill the bridge addressing gaps in women and men migrant workers protection in Africa through advocacy for the use of legal instruments, the role of the Pan-African Parliament and the African Union Labour Migration Advisory Committee. This theme has not been cho chosen at random. It is part of the uh, action, the joint action of the African Union Advisory Committee, ILO, IOM and UNECA in order to strengthen the effective governance and regulation of labour migration and mobility for enhanced sustainable development for inclusive economic growth and regional integration of the African continent. In this respect, this seminar, which will be a framework for exchange and experience sharing on labour migration in the African continent aimed at reflecting on the means to enhancing the uh, legal arsenal in this field. The migrant workers are vulnerable persons that are victims of violations of human rights because they are not citizens of the host countries because of their statutes. They, live, they often live in very precarious situations. Women migrants also are confronted to other challenges, including gender-based violences. According to the third edition on statistics on labor uh, migration in Africa, the continent had 23 interna million international migrants, including 20 million made of co-population in age of uh, work, only 14 14 million international workers were employed in 2019. This is why managing labor migration is a fundamental issue. It ensures the stability and the development of uh, uh, our uh, continent in, a, in, in an interdependent world where labor force is essential because these workers contribute to the development of the host countries and also fill the gaps of uh, and the loopholes uh, of the labor market. Therefore, it is necessary to protect the, lab, the uh, mi labor migrants legally. The vulnerability of these people, of these migrants, and also in order to fight against uh, any uh, discrimination. The Pan-African Parliament, as a consultative organ of the African Union, is called upon to uh, be a leader in the process of the ratification and legislative incorporation of legal uh, instruments in the field of the uh, labor force mobility, ratification, and implementation of international and regional instruments on labor migration remains a challenge for the continent because the member states are not all at the same level of advancement towards ratification and in legislative uh, mainstreaming of the legal instruments. This joint seminar will consider in depth the following issues the legal international continental and regional frameworks in the field of migration, the refugee regime, international standards of labor, trade and services, the free movement of persons and international criminal law in relation to the illicit trafficking of migrants and human trafficking. The analysis of all these issues will lead 
to resolutions and recommend and recommendations that we will incorporate in your legislations in order to contribute to pos to the positive revision of the instru legal instruments related to the protection of labor and at the same time you will have to lead some advocacy campaigns to other with other the other country the Romanian countries that have not yet ratified these instruments dear colleagues dear participants I do hope that the personalities present here in this joint seminar will get familiar with the conditions and international treaties in the field of labor migration, especially the adoption of the African Union Protocol on the free movement of people, the AFCFTA. Agenda 2063, the political migration framework of the African Union. As representatives of the African peoples, we are expected to make sure that our actions and efforts are strategies aiming at implementing implementing uh, migration policies, adequate migration policies in order to ensure the protection of our migrant labor workers. We need also to work hard to achieve our lofty objectives so I'm convinced and I'm confident that this joint seminar will improve the knowledge and expertise of the members of our committees on the international treaties and conventions and will enable the Pan-African Parliament to define strategies to promote and reinforce the migration policies of our workers throughout the continent. Given the importance of this theme, I would like to invite, invite you to follow very closely the various presentations that will be made to us in order to uh, open constructive discussions in favor of our migrant workers. Let me now declare open the uh, deliberations and the procedures uh, of the uh, joint seminar. on our legal workers throughout advocacy through the advocacy for the use of legal instruments the role of the Pan-African Parliament and the African Union Labour Migration Advisory Committee I thank you very much for listening Let's give a round of applause to our guest of honor. Thank you so much. Uh, we have now come to the end of the opening session. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our guests uh, that have made uh, uh, their key remarks uh, related to the theme that is our focus of our discussion today. Uh, and also, I wish to recognize the presence of uh, our Vice Presidents of the Pan-African Parliament uh, for being here. Uh, this is a very, this is very important for us because it shows how committed they are in terms of supporting our work as committees. So I would like to thank them very much for being here. Uh, so we have come to the end of this session. We are slightly late, but I believe we shall be able to cover what we had planned to do. Uh, if our guests are willing to continue with us, we will uh, certainly welcome them. Uh, but if they want to leave at their own pleasure, we will also allow them to do so. So right now, then, we will move to the next session. Uh, and uh, we can see off uh, our guests, those who would want to leave now, but uh, we'll continue with the next session. Okay. You see, okay, very good. Thank you, thank you so much.
So thank you very much. Uh, our next session is um, is that the technical aspect of this session. Uh, the we have about uh, four sessions. I would like to go through the program very quickly, although you already have it. The first session will be moderated by myself, and the presentation will be will be done by the JLMP from the African Union Commission, uh, Madam Odette. Uh, I hope she's around. Thank you so much. Um, then the next session uh, will be moderated by the chairperson of the PAP Committee on Gender, Family, Youth, and People with Disability, uh, Madam Mariam uh, de Gabala. Uh, and, uh, but that will be after a discussion. Every, every session we have a short session of discussion. And the presentation will be done by Ms. Barbara Banda, uh, member representing women in cross-border trade. I hope she's around. Welcome. Uh, then the third session, we will, after that we'll have a discussion, and then the third session will be moderated by the chairperson of the PAP Committee on Justice and Human Rights, Honorable Jean-Marie. Uh, he's around, uh, so he'll be moderating that particular session, and then we shall also have a discussion. Then thereafter, we, that discussion will be, pre will be presented, uh, the presentation will be done by uh, uh, somebody from Elmac again. Uh, I hope that person is here. Uh, then the fourth session, which is the final one, will be moderated by the deputy chairperson of the Pan African Committee on Trade, Customs, and Immigration Matters. Uh, basically, looking at uh, uh, developing the final communique as well as the way forward for the Pan African Parliament. Uh, and then after that, we shall have a closing session. Uh, which will be done by the chairperson of the Pan-African Parliament Committee on Health. So that's how the program looks like, and uh, I hope we shall be able to go through it very quickly. Uh, and uh, without wasting a lot of time, um, I think you all had an opportunity to look at the concept note. I'd intended to briefly talk about it, but uh, because of uh, short, short of time, I will not go through it, but uh, basically uh, what we are discussing here is uh, issues related to migration and the challenges that face uh, men and women uh, migrant workers. And we are lucky to have experts to be able to make their technical presentations, uh, and after which we shall be able to have an opportunity to discuss those presentations. So without wasting a lot of time, allow me to invite uh, Madame Odette uh, to make her keynote address, and then thereafter we shall have a discussion. Welcome, Madam. Good morning, everyone. Honorable members of the Pan African Parliament. Distinguished guests, all protocol observe. My name is Odette Sarboli. I'm the new JLMP program coordinator for the African Union Commission. I hope that the presentation will be shown for the technical first. So, if not, maybe I will just proceed. Ah, it's already there on the screen. Thank you so much. So, it's my single honor and, and pleasure to present to you today the joint program on labor migration governance for integration and development in Africa, better known as the GLMP. So next, please. So what is the GLMP? The GLMP is a joint program on labor migration governance for, as I just said it, for integration and development in Africa. And it's a comprehensive program which is quite bold and transnational program in Africa, that ambition to strengthen the effective governance and regulation of labor migration and mobility to enhance sustainable development in a very inclusive economic growth and regional integration of the African continent. So in a single word, this is a continental program that aim to promote safe, regular, and orderly labor migration within the continent. So this continental program 
as its name mentioned it, is a joint approach, and it is implemented by the African Union Commission, the International Labor Organization, better known as ILO, the International Organization for Migration, REM, and the UNICA. So it is also implemented through other relevant partners operating in Africa, and it includes development cooperation actors, private sector organizations, trade union, and civil society representatives. So the GLMP is an instrument dedicated to the implementation of some key continental policy instruments related to labor migration and mobility. I would like just to cite some of those instruments and policy. You have the 50 key priority area of the declaration and plan of action and employment, poverty eradication, and inclusive development. And such instrument was adopted by the Assembly of Head of State and Government in 2015 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. We have also another key instrument which is in line with the agenda 2063 and which contribute to the achievement of the first 10 year implementation plan of agenda 2023, uh, which is between 2014 and 2023 and also the sustainable, the UN Sustainable Development Goal, better known as the SDGs. So still under the key instrument and policy that JLMP is dedicated, you have also what we call the AU Migration Policy Framework for Africa and its action plan 2018 and 2030. Next, please. So as a continental program, this, the JLMP advocates for the protection, promotion, and safeguarding of universal human and labor rights for migrant workers and members of their families, because it has to be a very inclusive program. And it also upholds the principle of equal treatment and opportunities, as well as non-discrimination. The GLMP also recognized that the need of women, men and boys and girls, and very, uh, very, varies at different stage of migration because they don't have the same needs. And I have think this has been reiterated since this morning through the different uh, speech that we have heard so far. That's why also, sorry. Sorry, uh, just let me come back. So as I was saying, the GLMP advocate for the promotion, protection, promotion, and self-guiding with a special focus on women, men, boys, and girls, because we all know that they have different needs through the different process of migration. It also promotes advocacy for gender equality and equity, as well as equitable access to all resources and decision maker to employ each person. So as being a continental program, in order to implement it, the JLMP teams has come up with some key project because this is a longer term program that could not be implemented at once because it has several strategic priority and a whole pool of activities. So to make it more concrete, so far we have been implementing some key project I would like just to introduce you to some of those projects, but still, we are still looking for additional funding so that we can expand our intervention to all the continent. So, so far, these are the three main projects that we have been implementing. The first one is a GLMP priority that was funded by CEDA, and it, grown, it was uh, implemented mainly in, within the RECS, EAC, ECOWAS, and SADC. So that first, project ended in March 2022, and currently we are winding up on the activities. We have also two other projects that has been funded respectively by SDD, SDC, and CEDA. So the first one is called the GLMP Action. So it was funded by, as I said, SDC, and it started in July 2021, and it will end in December 2024. So for this new JLMP action, in terms of geographical coverage, we are targeting two, target, uh, two regs, regional economic committees that are COMESA and ECOS. 
We have also started implementing at member state level. That's why we are currently piloting in Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, Malawi, and Morocco. So these are the five member states where GLMP is currently being implemented through what we call the GLMP action. We have also a, uh, a third new project that has been funded by CEDA that will be running from 1st of April 2022 to 31st March 2025. Again, in terms of geographical coverage, it will be EAC, ECOWAS, SADEC, ECAS, and EGAT. So this third one is only focusing on regs. And the ultimate goal is to, pro, to, uh, to strengthen labor migration governance within the continent. So in terms of activities, I would like just to share with you some key activities. So the GLMP activities is a response to the need identified by African government in the Ouagadougou 2004 Declaration on Employment, Poverty eradic Eradication, and Inclusive Development. So the key activity areas of the program address mainly two aspects. The first one is the governance component that deals with policy, uh, laws, and strengthening institution and tripartism. The second aspect has to do with the operational component because we wanted also this program to be very operational so that people can see uh, the, the can see actually the impact that GLMP has in this continent. So the co second component has to deal with descent work because we cannot talk about labor migration without referring to descent work. Addressing skill shortage, also it has to do with skill portability. I think this is a very critical area when we talk about labor migration within this, con uh, this, within this continent. How can we ensure that those young people that are graduated in uh, West Africa when they move to Southern Africa, their degrees are recognized and their skills are recognized. That's why we are also referring to mutual recognition of qualification. We, all, we cannot talk also about labor migration governance without putting an emphasis on the labor migration statistic. That's why this is also part of the operational uh, component. We have also the protection of migrant workers because I think during all the speech we have here since this morning, they have been referring to the vulnerability that migrant workers are often facing with, which has to deal also with trafficking. So the GLMP works with member states and the regs. So uh, the member states are our main beneficiaries as well as the regional economic committees. We work also with workers and employers because we are talking about labor and we work also with other relevant stakeholders to address the need and concern of African migrant workers within and outside the continent. Because we all know that African migrant workers not, uh, move not only within the continent, but they also migrate to other continents for work purposes. And those continents, it include the Gulf countries and Europe. So the support is targeted to labor inspectorates because they have the, the, the regulation rules we also work with public and private employment agencies because these are very critical when we talk about labor mobility. Recruitment is a very critical area. And we also, in order to ensure better and regulated recruitment practices. So as part of our intervention also, we increase awareness and advocacy for more policy that facilitate decent work for migrant workers. So we support tribalism because we cannot talk about labor without the trade unions and the employers. These are critical uh, stakeholders. So it includes through the policy development process. So the JLMP has mainly four main pillars uh, capa uh, with capacity building as a cross-cutting approach. So we really work a lot on capacity building of our member states as well as the REC. So pillar one, support the selected member states and regs on labor migration governance and regulation for women and men migrant workers in Africa. As far as Pillar 2 is concerned, it supports women and men migrant workers to access social protection and material recognition of skills and education level. As far as Pillar number 3 is concerned, it supports the evidence-based labor migration management through increased 
use of labor migration disaggregated data and statistic. And finally, our fourth pillar has to do with steering, uh, coordination, and implementation of the labor migration issue and the GLMP. Because actually, you know, there are so many stakeholders when it comes to labor migration. That's why coordination is key to avoid duplication of efforts. Next, please. Now, where do you see the role of PAP, of you honorable members uh, of the Pan-African Parliament? Where do we see your role in the work we are doing? So we do believe that in line with the GLMP project, you have a key role to play. Let me just cite some of those roles that we are foreseeing for you. To participate in creating awareness among the people of Africa on the AUC objective and strengthening the right of migrant workers under the GLMP. We believe that also you can help us promote the human and labor right of migrant workers and their members of family through the various activities of the program. We also see an adversary role for you and this adversary role, we have break it down into two. The first one is that PAP was uh, consulted and gave direction on the development of the declaration on the protection and promotion of the right of migrant workers and the AU guidelines on the development of bilateral agreement. The JLMP project have planned to undertake a number of activities with you uh, in consultation with you. And the second part of the role or the adversary role that we are also foreseeing is in participating in the LMAC, the Labor Migration Advisory Committee. So PAP has contributed to the development of policy brief in various labor migration thematic areas, as well as participating during various meetings of the LMAC, and I think the seminar today is also a good example of that. So AUC welcome more collaboration with you. We also, uh, uh, another role is that facilitate advocacy and capacity building meetings and training for the honorable members that you are, as well as the regional and national parliament on labor migration. Fifth, fourth, promote support the ratification of relevant international human rights and labor standard and domestication of these standards in national law and policy in the selected AU member state. I think this is one of the key objectives of this seminar today, how we can work together to, uh, to promote the ratification, but mainly the adoption and domestication. And finally, support, we see your role also in supporting us in implementing the joint labor migration program. So now coming back to the implementation of this continental program. So this is how we are kind of organized. We have the staffing part. So AUC today have dedicated second staff uh, for, uh, at, the, at the AUC, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a one of them, and I have also my colleagues Amo here, and the others are still in Addis Ababa. We have also secondary staff at Comesa, at, at some regs such as Comesa, ECAS, ECOAS, and EAC. And uh, in terms of teamwork, we are promoting really teamwork through creating common understanding of the project and an objective regular reporting and continuous engagement of the stakeholders. And the seminar, seminar today also contribute to that engagement we have with all the, stakes, uh, all the stakeholders. When it comes to synergy, as I was saying, we have a multi-stakeholder uh, multi uh, approach when it comes to labor migration. So that's why we are trying to ensure linkage and synergy with related program at the continental, regional, and national level. I'm sure that in all your respective countries, there are already ongoing initiative where the program or project related to labor migration. So our aim is not to come and duplicate those efforts. Our aim is to come and complement them. So when it comes to leveraging, you are currently leveraging on existing technical and financial resources. I told you that currently we are only operating at the regs level as well as in five member states. But our main objective is to expand this program so that it can be implemented in all the 54 African countries. Now moving forward, uh, we are also trying to align the project with the JLMP uh, through monitoring and evaluation from work. Uh, we are also promoting a uniform governance, so all the initiative under this project will fit into some existing project steering committee and PTC. 
and also we promote complementarity, as I just said it, and we build on the lesson learned so far from other GLMP projects, promote technical and political engagement. Last but not least, when it comes to governance of this continental program, so this is how we are organized. We have a program steering committee, we have a program technical committee, and we have a program support unit. So myself and my colleagues here, we belong to the program support unit. We are doing the daily coordination with the other stakeholders, such as IEM, ILO, and UNCA. So I would like to stop here, just uh, for the sake of time, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Odette, for that presentation, uh, which highlights the, the challenges uh, that exist, but also the role of the Pan-African Parliament in terms of uh, uh, collaboration uh, on this particular issue. Um, honorable members of Parliament, um, Obviously, like we have been uh, informed in the presentation, the Joint Labor Migration Program was officially launched in February 2022, uh, and its aim was mainly to strengthen effective governance and regulation of labor migration and mobility for enhanced sustainable development, for inclusive economic growth, and regional integration of the African continent. And like we've been told, it builds upon the implementation of the fifth uh, priority area of the declaration and plan of uh, action on employment, poverty eradication, and inclusive development, which was adopted by the Assembly of Heads of State and Governments uh, of 3rd January 2015 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, and therefore, uh, this particular seminar we are attending now uh, we aim at fostering a dialogue uh, for Pan-African Parliament uh, to collaborate with AU ELMAC and to promote the protection of migrant workers and address the increased discrimination faced by migrants, especially women and men, labor migrants. And uh, PAP being a legislative uh, organ of the African Union, it's expected to play a, a critical role in the ratification and domestication of relevant legal instruments on labor and migration. So some of these issues have clearly been highlighted in the presentation, and without wasting a lot of time, uh, we'll give an opportunity to honorable members of parliament to uh, make their either comments or questions on the presentation that uh, we've just listened to. And because of the time factor, uh, we'll try to take as few contributions as possible. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for the discussion before we move to the next, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, unless if you are willing for us to continue into the afternoon, but I know there are committees that have some work in the afternoon, and uh, so it will be very difficult. But uh, let's give an opportunity to any member of parliament that has uh, uh, some contribution. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I'll, you'll excuse me because I will not be able to mention your names, but I can see a gentleman, a honorable member of parliament uh, at the f on the far left. Uh, please make your contribution, and then we move on to the next one on the same side. And then uh, we have a third one on the other side, uh, and a fourth one on the other side, okay. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the gentleman at the back. Thank you very much, uh, honorable chair. We've had the presentations, We're very delighted by the comments that we've had. This is a very important uh, discussion, and I believe that uh, the discussion should be polarized because it's a very important issue, which is affecting all our people across the continent. Honorable Chair, what I have not uh, heard from the deliberations is the the definition of uh, migration, because uh, we have comments such as uh, illegal migration. And uh, in some of our countries, uh, migration is not illegal. What is illegal is those who uh, coerce or kind of uh, support 
or try to cajole uh, people to, to move so that they can be able to traffic them. So that trafficking is what I believe should be, uh, should be criminalized. But migration in itself should not be criminalized. So whatever regulation or legislation that we are making, uh, we should ensure that uh, it is emphasized that uh, migration is not an illegal activity. Uh, what is illegal is trafficking. And uh, so that uh, this thing should be properly uh, monitored, should be properly uh, sensitized to our various countries so that uh, when they see migrants, they'll be able to deal with them as ordinary human beings who are looking for good life that they could not get from their, their home countries. On that basis, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member of Parliament. Uh, the next uh, contribution, Honorable Member. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Chair, thank you very much. Let me... When you do your uh, contribution, perhaps you can mention your name. It will be in the interest of all of us. Maybe we'll start with the former... Okay, thank you very much. I'm Honorable Swaibu Ture, a uh, member of Parliament of the Gambia Parliament and uh, a member of the Human Rights Commission. Thank you very much. So you can continue, Honorable Member. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm Dr. Abanu. I'm from Niger. May I begin by thanking the presenter for the wealth of information she shared in her presentation. It was very rich and has provided, uh, has shed a great deal of light on the theme. I would like to understand a little further because in the presentation we were informed that there is not a sufficient level of ratification. It's very few have ratified this convention, but we've not been given any precision on this. If I've understood well, our role as parliamentarians is to attempt to emphasize the essential aspects of these conventions so that countries who have not yet uh, ratified, they can do so. If we do not understand how far we are uh, specifically on ratification, it may be difficult for colleagues to know uh, if they are involved or not to increase this ratification. And then for the legal instruments now, I'm not sure what uh, is your proposal so that all parliamentarians from different countries can understand the existing documents in this regard. So let me end, Chair. I trust I've well understood, but I did think it was three projects that were mentioned. On the third project, could I have some information as to the criteria to uh, uh, lead to the choice of the countries you mentioned? This is a third project you mentioned. It's where it's being carried out. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, honor, uh, Honorable uh, Member of Parliament. Uh, we we'll go to the next uh, contribution on the far right. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Abdul from Comoros, member of the Committee of Trade, Custom and Immigration Matters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for sending us the document earlier. That's allow us to understand better about uh, these issues. Uh, we had a wonderful presentation from Dr. Uh, Alves, uh, Sabelo, and now Odette. They are very uh, wonderful. My question to the African Union Labor Migration Committee, uh, if there is any mechanism to follow up after member states uh, ratify uh, these conversions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Abdu. Uh, Honorable member from Uganda. Uh, thank you can so switch off your mic, Honorable Abdu. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm called Musana Eric, a member of parliament from Uganda. And uh, just like my colleagues have said, I want to commend 
uh, the earlier presenters and uh, for the wonderful presentation that is so rich and uh, it has uh, really energized us members. Mr. Chairman, I have only one interest uh, to put across and this is basically on how this uh, program is uh, helping member states to increase uh, employment opportunities. Um, you are well aware that uh, we are scrambling for the meager uh, job opportunities available across the continent. We are well aware that uh, this is the biggest uh, problem we have, especially to the young people who are highly skilled but do not have opportunities. We are happy that the AU is coming up to uh, do a lot of uh, uh, protectionism, a lot of uh, helping hand to the immigrant workers, but we still have meager opportunities. And now we are moving up and down from state to state, but we are taking very little to support member countries in increasing more uh, employment opportunities. And this is one of the biggest problems we have across Africa. And we are seeing many countries, many young people uh, are in strikes, demonstrations, uh, uh, wanting to have better opportunities. Of course, at some level we shall go and evaluate the quality of these uh, job opportunities. So what, what are you doing in helping member countries create more uh, job opportunities so that we can have most of these things settled once and for all. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Musa. Uh, let's uh, listen to the Honorable Member up there. Then uh, let us on the Honorable Member from Burundi. Please go ahead. Shukran. Yes, go Shukran ahead. Shukran, Saeedo. Shukran, Saeedo. Uh, Saleh Dirk. صالح دركوي من ليبيا الحديث عن الهجرة والمهاجرين حديث طبعا لديه شجون كثيرة وليست المرة الأولى نحن نتحدث في هذا البرنامج عن موضوع الحجب وأغلب المواضيع مكررة في هذا البرنامج نحن تحدثنا عن هذا الموضوع قد يكون Oui, c'est bon, c'est bon. Yes, so thank you, Chair. So, Mr. Chair, I was saying that we have debated the issue of immigration at length. It's a very important matter, and I remember a few years ago, I think it was in 2018, we did discuss this matter, and now we are here again to further discuss it. But I think we need to rather emphasize different aspects. First of all, we need to define immigration. What do we mean by immigration? What labor force are we speaking of? Are we speaking of legal or illegal workforce? There are two types of work workers. I'm from Libya, and in Libya we have many migrants in our country in Libya. Now, we are talking about the issue of migration and labor once again. But you will be aware that many African migrants have lost their lives in attempting to leave their countries to seek opportunities, work opportunities, that is. They've taken risks and have lost their lives in the sea. So once again, I would like to say that this is a very, very important matter, but I think we need to be aware of what uh, level of workers we're speaking. Are we speaking of clandestine migration? Are we speaking of legal, uh, normal migration where rules are being followed? Many migrants, as I've said, have left their countries seeking work opportunities elsewhere and have lost their lives. So I think we need to give further attention to this issue, but not be coming back every year just to talk about it without proposing appropriate solutions. I believe we need to understand what are the uh, 
causes of migration, how migration is taking place, and why is it that people are lo losing their lives? Let's not come here just to repeat ourselves, but rather to propose solutions. I believe we need to take the appropriate steps to find solutions to the problems. Thank you, Chair. Jean-Marie. Th thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Member from Burundi. Uh, uh, I'm Niyamba Jamari. I am the chair of the Committee of Legal Matters and Human Rights. I'm from Burundi, as you've said. Now, this issue has been addressed from different angles. However, I'm wondering if you're if you've included agents, uh, labor uh, agencies. In the documents that we have read, migrants arrive in the host country and many are ill-treated, as has been said. So I'm wondering, your program, your institution, what are you doing to address the agencies themselves who are seeking uh, workers when they invite migrant workers to come and seek employment. Um, I'm wondering when migrants or workers find that they are being ill-treated when they have moved to find work, are there any, uh, do they have any recourse? Where do they go to seek help? Thank you. Thank you very much. We have already had six of them, but I can see one. Let's do the last one, or the last two, and then we can give opportunity to Madame Ode to make her presentation. So the last two. Thank you. I'm uh, Honorable Togari P. from Zimbabwe. Um, I want to thank you for the presentations that we, uh, really touched a lot of areas uh, that we value uh, as we face a lot of migration throughout the world. However, I would want us to also look at migration, intercontinental migration, where when you move from Africa to other parts of the world, we see our people being mistreated. But when it's either them coming to our, to our side, there's little or less uh, mistreatment of those who migrate to Africa. We also want to emphasize that your organization must take keen interest even in Africa where you have Africans moving from one country to another, how they are looked after, the challenges they face. Surely at this age, after liberating Africa, we still consider ourselves foreigners in Africa. What can we do to deal with that? What can your organization help African states understand that we are just one people? We shouldn't mistreat each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable from Zimbabwe. The last, you know, we will have more discussions even after the other presentations. So any issues that uh, are key, we can still have them in the next session because it's, it's a continuation of the same uh, presentation. So let's listen to the last one, and then we will uh, give an opportunity to other discussions later. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. I want to thank the presenters for a half-done job. Uh, first, we received documents. At the moment, we are supposed to listen and make our contributions, so I don't know whether we can migrate ourselves properly to make optimum contributions, but we are now forced to make discursive contributions. So I'll do so first. It's not can, clear can from he, the presentation can, can that, mention uh, your name, sir? that, sorry. Your name and country. Swarbwe Bernardes from Namibia. Okay. What is not clear is, where, where is the problem? Is it state institutions that are ill-treating workers? migrant workers? Is it private sector companies? Where, where precisely is the problem? Uh, so it's not well located. Is it a question of uh, labor laws that are dubious or do not meet international standards? 
Where precisely is the problem? It's not located legally and technically. Where is the problem? The statements of migrants and diminished rights is very generically stated. It's not helpful to, uh, to, to lead the debate. In other words, who are the perpetrators? Secondly, what is it that the colleagues are proposing in terms of what they call statelessness of the children of the migrant workers? Thirdly, I think my Ugandan colleague highlighted some important issue. What are we doing uh, to address the state's capacities? You may have problems of interstate conflict that may arise as a result of some migration that seems to be unstoppable from one country to the other. What, what informs the movement, therefore, of migrants in their studies from one area to the other? Is it a question of political instability? Is it a question of employment problems? What is it? Because the study should tell us what they have analyzed, what evidence they are looking at to help PAP to make its full contribution to, to the discussion. The, 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 the documents are very generic. Uh, so therefore, one struggles uh, to, to locate where where one can actually come in to address which policy shortcomings. Uh, the, the question of uh, 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 discrimination, uh, the question of uh, competition for jobs that migrants may be seen to be taking. My colleague also from Libya asked, what types of jobs are we talking about? Is it skills that are highly sought after? Is it work in plantations, what, what are we talking about? And I see uh, the question, therefore, of child labor also uh, it, it becomes, becomes an issue. So, so this document, I think, needs, needs, needs a bit of rework so that we are well informed about what we are saying. But I must say, Chair, uh, we are new members, so there was apparently a discussion of this matter in 2018. What it resolved, we don't know, because from here, PAP is expected to go and do advocacy, to go and do mobilization, uh, to help with better understanding uh, of JLMP and help with recommendations on cooperation. It can't come from this document. This document is a bit empty. Now, I know the colleagues meant well, but it's very empty. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member uh, from Namibia. Uh, if you allow me, we will give the opportunity to Madam Odette uh, from the African Union Commission to uh, comment on the questions and the inputs made by the honorable members of parliament. Uh, try to be as brief as possible so that we can be able to move to the next session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Chairman. I will try to answer to some of them, and I will invite also Mr. Sabelo to step in if needed. Uh, definitely, uh, the definition of migration from Honorable Turi. Yeah, migration can be both internal or external. So we have internal migration, we have external migration, we have national and international migration. So when we talk about labor migration, Mainly we are focusing on the international migration dynamic. Those people crossing the border, the border of the origin of countries to go and look for job opportunity elsewhere. So internal migration also can be triggered by many factors. Sometimes it can be uh, unrest. It can be also natural disaster. That's why we talk about internal displaced people. People that are moving from one region to another region, maybe because of natural disaster, or people that are re removing the rural areas to go to the cities to find also a job. This is still internal migration. So when they cross the border, we are under the international migration dynamic. Uh, pour, uh, uh, I'm switching to French, if you don't mind, uh, pour répondre à, à l'honorable député du Niger. Uh, la, la convention, quels sont les pays qui ont ratifié cette convention Où est-ce que nous en sommes uh, Ce que je vais proposer, c'est qu'à la fin de ce séminaire, on va envoyer, on peut envoyer uh, un récapitulatif des pays africains qui ont déjà uh, ratifié et adopté cette convention. Ça vous donnera déjà une idée. Mais je sais que d'emblée, de façon générale... Translation, yeah. translation. Yeah. Translation, we, 
Uh, if you change the translation number, you should let us know. Can you hear me? Can you hear the interpreter? Let me repeat what I've just said. The Honorable MP from Niger asked the question on the ratification of the convention. What countries have ratified the convention? And so I would suggest that at the end of this seminar, you, we will send to you an update of the countries that have ratified these conventions. This will give you an idea about it. But broadly speaking, if I may, I, I can say that a few, very few countries have already ratified the convention. I'm not going to uh, um, point out any name, any country, but I'll give you an, an update of the countries that have uh, ratified and which will enable you to uh, make an advocacy in your countries. Let me switch to English now with your permission to answer the Honorable MP Abdi. mechanism that uh, AU has put in place to ratify those conventions. Maybe I'll turn to Mr. Sabello, if you can uh, just uh, share some of the mechanisms that are existing. Or if you allow me, I just wrap up on all the questions and I will let you cover that one. Uh, now, now moving to Honorable Eric from Uganda. I think you raise a very critical question regarding how we are helping member states to, to improve employment opportunities in the respective countries. One of the triggers we all know of labor migration is looking for better job opportunities. But also one of the challenges in this continent is the limited uh, portability, uh, social, uh, the limited uh, recognition of skills. Skills mobility is a real issue. We have been talking about that for years. Some regs have even started developing policies on skills mobility, portability of social benefit. But we are still at the level of development. We are not yet concretely. So through this GLMP program, what we are promoting is skills mobility, portability of social benefits. We are also working on supporting some member states in developing what we call the labor market information system. Unfortunately, currently, I don't think there is a country, a country in this continent that have a full-fledged labor market information system. Some countries have already started investing in that, in that but it's not yet fully fledged. Some are, some are very well advanced. Others are still at the startup. Because those labor migration information system will allow to, or member states to know where are the gaps, what are the skills that are needed that they cannot find in their respective countries. What are also the skills that they can look around? Because we are talking about regional economic committees where they can find, it. let's say in Uganda, what are the skills that Ugandan cannot be found within the Ugandan that you can find in Kenya or in Rwanda, things like that. So the labor market information system are not really operating. And we are trying through this GLMP program to also support member states to have full-fledged labor migration system. One of the area of advocacy where you can also help us is this mutual recognition of qualification and also the skilled mobility. We have been talking about that, as I said, there are even some projects that are running, uh, implemented by other stakeholders that are still contributing to that. But I think we need a real, real advocacy. So that, as I was saying in my presentation, when a young African is graduated from Northern Africa, he can find easily a job in Central Africa and vice versa. But currently, it's not the case. That's why employment is still very critical and is still very difficult. We have highly skilled young people that are still struggling to find jobs. Uh, moving forward. Uh, Okay, uh, to Honorable from Burundi, if you don't mind. Uh, I will, uh, no, no, that was not from Burundi. From Libya. From Libya. Yeah. Okay, yes, you are right. Through the GLMP, we are trying to promote safe, orderly, and dignified labor migrations. But also we are trying to leave no one behind. 
But what we are mainly promoting is regular labor migrant. Unfortunately, the images we are seeing in Libya and other uh, countries in Northern Africa, is, these are victims of trafficking. This is not the type of migration we are promoting. We are promoting really safe, as I said, orderly, regular mainly, and dignified. So that's the kind of labor migrant workers we are referring here. However, those who are victims of trafficking also should be assisted and help them regain their dignity. That's what we are referring here, but definitely we are talking about regular migration, labor migration mainly. Uh, I'll just switch to French, if you don't mind. Uh, pour répondre à l'honorable député du Burundi. In a reaction to the honorable from uh, Burundi, it's true you mentioned recruitment agencies. I would like to come back on the role of states because migration governance is an issue of national sovereignty. There must be a legal framework. Unfortunately, in most of our country countries, there is the lack of this legal framework. The management of uh, labor migration. That is why you see in the program of uh, GLMP, we lay emphasis on policies and legal frameworks that must be set up to manage this labor migration as in all domains. It must be managed. It must have a legal framework. Unfortunately, I worked personally. I worked in Burundi for about two years. I know Burundi very well. I know Uganda. It's, these are countries in which I worked. Unfortunately, most often, we have recruitment agencies that recruit, recruit labor and put them or send them abroad without any legal framework. And it's a problem because when these migrant workers are exposed to grievous violation of their rights in their host countries, unfortunately, they don't have anybody to make recourse to. Most often, they make recourse to embassies, which usually do not have labor expert, uh, experts. And it falls back on council agents. These are some of the problems. I think when you would carry out your advocacy, you should help us to have legal frameworks in our various countries that manage labor governance that can address concerns because in most African countries, there are countries that are usually destination countries, but also host countries, and it really requires governance. And there must be a, a regulatory framework for these recruitment agencies. I know that in Uganda, which I know very well, they have a regulatory framework that govern the activities of recruitment agencies. Recently, Uganda even passed a law, I think it was last year, in August, 2021, they passed a law on the regulatory framework of recruit, private recruitment agencies. We need this regulatory framework. We need policies and laws on labor migration. Without this, there would always be a legal vacuum and others would always use it to send migrants abroad and when they are challenged nobody would be available to help them that is what i had to say that is why usually we are faced with these problems i would now go back to english uh, migration from africa to other part of the world the mistreatment i think yeah that's a very good comment uh, i i sometimes said charity begins homes and I think uh, if you look at the GLMP program, the focus is first within Africa. How can we promote a safe, regular, and dignified labor migration within Africa? But we cannot also close our eyes to the fact that Africa can also move elsewhere. But definitely, I totally agree with you that we need also to strengthen our efforts to make Africans feel home wherever they go. Now, moving to Honorable from Namibia for the half done job. Uh, allow me to apologize if the documents 
does not meet your expectations. But definitely, uh, what we are promoting here. Yes, we know some countries have some labor laws, but also some countries, the laws, as you mentioned it very well, that not meet the international standards. That's why we are talking about uh, promote ratification and domestication. Because sometimes the laws are at the level of the regs, they are very well written and very well developed. But member states do not adopt them, or they can ratify them, but do not domesticate them. And that's when it become an issue. I would like just to give an example. In 2016, I was in one of the African, in one of the country in West Africa. You know, we have the ECOWAS, the free movement. I'm an ECOWAS citizen. Whenever, whenever, whenever I'm moving within ECOWAS, I consider myself as an ECOWAS citizen. I don't even mention my nationality. So I was in that country, and the immigration officer at the airport told me, oh, you are working for this institution. I will give you one month entry. I say, you are not supposed to give me one month entry. As I'm an ECOWAS citizen, I'm entitled to three months. And the guy look at me twice, say, I say, I will give you one month. So this show that at the level of ECOWAS, it's a free movement. You can say in any ECOWAS uh, countries for three months. But for this immigration officer, though his country has signed and ratified, but it was not domesticated in their national law. So that's also an issue. That's what we are talking here. Uh, so the reason why people are moving, there are many, many reasons. I will just maybe cite some of them. One of them is political instability, as you mentioned it, that can trigger people to move. We have also the search for better opportunities for young people. We have also poverty. Poverty is one of the drivers of mobility, generally speaking. But we have also a new one, that is the disaster and any environmental and climate change. Uh, more and more people are talking about climate change and environmental issues being a trigger of mobility and also in somehow migration and labor migration. So there are many, many reasons that can force people to move. But these are some of the key drivers, but there, it's not exhaustive, but there are also others. So yeah, uh, and also, yeah, you're definitely right to talk about the competitions of jobs, because that's one of the reasons why migrant workers are all sometimes very vulnerable. Because you will go to a given country, and the national will say, okay, these these foreigners are coming to take our jobs. And uh, that's why today we cannot talk about labor migration without putting a focus on xenophobia. These are also issues that we should not uh, sh uh, shy away by discussing. Because the same way trafficking is an issue related to labor migration, I often say that trafficking and labor migration are two sides of one coin. If people are not, regulated, are not recruited regularly, they are rec recruited irregularly, and that's when they fall under trafficking. But also xenophobia is a real issue, challenge today. We need to address when we talk about labor migration. So this is in a nutshell what I wanted to share. Sorry if I do not really deep dive in some of your questions. I will turn to Mr. Stabello if he has some, anything he would like to add on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Od Odette. Um, maybe I'll touch on some, on, on some legal or policy frameworks that AU has, or, or, and structures that AU has put in place uh, to try to respond to some of the challenges that are related to, to labor migration, but also migration in general. Uh, with regards to ratification, uh, we do advocacy, and these are the policies of member states. Uh, there is a, a biannual a ministerial conference that I believe we all are aware about, which usually called the STC. Uh, this is the specialized, specialized technical committees, but it's a, it's a, it's a ministerial uh, conference that comes uh, after every two years. Uh, that's where we present the documents and uh, encourage member states to ratify uh, some of these conventions. 
Uh, when we are doing our work on migration, but also labor migration, we all our work is anchored on a policy that is referred to as migration policy framework that was adopted by uh, member states. So that the work, let's talk about uh, the Libya situation where there's been an influx um, or a big movement into, into, into Libya. Um, the question from the honorable member, are, the, are we talking about regular or um, illegal? The language that we use at African Union uh, when we talk about uh, migrants that are, are, are not uh, documented, we, we say it's a irregular migration. That's the language that we use. So we see all those movements as irregular migration. Um, but as my colleague has said, we promote safe, orderly, and dignified and regular uh, migration. But then Burundi, the movements here, uh, but uh, a challenge to all of us, a challenge to you, honorable members, the movements in uh, uh, maybe from Africa to other regions, uh, we are largely, we are largely a ascending continent. Our people are moving to GCC countries. Our people are moving to the Gulf states, Middle East. Uh, the African people are moving to Europe and to other regions. We are ascending. Perhaps the question is, what are the drivers? Yes, that question was posed, and, uh, and my colleague Odette has responded to that. Uh, but if we are talking about intra-Africa movements, uh, the skills deficit in other areas, uh, economic uh, movements, people are looking for better opportunities. Um, but then, as far as we are concerned at African Union Commission, as a secretariat, the way we understand our member states is that our member states, it seems to us, as your secretariat, it seems to us, you are not ready to... Uh, allow and promote free movement. You are, we are definitely not ready. Why are we saying that? We've got a free movement protocol that was adopted by member states, but only four countries have ratified these. Well, congratulations to the chair. Chair is one of, the, uh, Rwanda is one of them that has ratified and three others, I think Capo Verde and others Oh, yes, yes, yes. So there are few countries that have ratified. Uh, what this says to us as your secretariat at the African Union is that we are not ready to see this free movement uh, in, the, in, in the continent. And yet, uh, the CFTA cannot succeed if there are no movements, free movements, or if we do not promote or improve free movement uh, in the country. But Namibia, you talked about the importance of also child labor. Yes, we have a policy, a framework, um, which is called a 10-year plan to eradicate uh, child labor, forced movement, uh, but also human trafficking and modern slavery. It, it looks at all these illicit uh, activities around the continent. So we're trying to promote all, all these um, uh, Libya, we've got, uh, what is the AU doing about the situation in um, irregular migration in Libya? There is some action. Uh, a, there is a tripartite task force, which is comprised of UN, EU, and AU. And this tripartite force includes IOM and UNHCR, uh, which has helped to repatriate uh, about 40,000 um, illegal migrants that were in, in, in Libya. So there's some efforts, but there is a big drive which, which creates uh, movements. You are aware, honorable members, that just in 2021 alone, there is a, an area in Africa uh, that was then uh, referred to as Kubelt. All these conflicts 
uh, are also the drivers of movements, not only intra-Africa, but also moving outside uh, the continent. Uh, and we cannot impose um, some laws on, on other regions, but we are engaging the meekly the um, uh, we are in the GCC countries, but we are also engaging with uh, with Europe, so that our people should not be mistreated uh, uh, and discriminated. On the other side, we are calling for the respect of the international laws on migration. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, doc thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bello. Uh, Dr. Rivera wants to make a another comment on the issues raised. So let's give him an opportunity. Merci, Monsieur le Président. No. Thank you, Chair. Well, I just want to compliment. Well, we now know that in our ECOWAS region, people move from one region to another to look for better likelihood to work. There is a huge migrate migratory flux in our region, into our region, compared with other regions in Africa. It's in our region that, it is in our region that people come, compared with other regions of the continent. With that said, I would like to add that in terms of regular or legal migration, as it was said here, in our region, as you know, there is this free movement which is implemented since 1979. Even though there are border harassments, it is a practice that is well known. People move from one country to another without any visa. It is a good thing, which is not the case in all the regions on the African continent. All these create problems in legal migration. We cannot have a Senegalese who goes to Nigeria or Guinea-Bissau and we call him illegal migrant. He will have document and he cannot be deported for such reasons. This, but in other regions, if you go to Cameroon or to Equatorial Guinea or to South Africa, Zimbabwe, you see things like that. People are deported they are Africans, but they are deported because they are considered illegal, whereas they are Africans. These are issues that must be looked at. As MPs, I think we should carry out advocacy uh, at the level of our governments and parliaments so that we start by ratifying the free movement protocol of Africa that will enable a free movement of people from one region to another. There are instruments from the African Union on migration governance. It's a good thing. We need to ratify. I do therefore urge parliamentarians to carry out this advocacy. Thank you. Vera, um, I think we are coming to the end of this uh, session. Uh, kindly, uh, Let's uh, give a round of applause to the experts from the African Union and, uh, and from uh, ECOWAS. Thank you so much. We are very grateful. We, have a very, we are very short time because we still have other three, pro uh, other three sessions. I'm told there is a coffee break and a photo shoot for all of us. I don't know, would you want us to continue so that uh, we finish at once? Very good. I think this United Mercy is supported. Uh, thank you so much. Then allow me to invite the chairperson of uh, the Committee on Gender, Family, Youth, and Pe People with Disability uh, to come and chair the next session. Uh, we will uh, allow you to take about, about 35 minutes for the whole session. So the chairperson of gender, um, Family, youth, and people with disability, uh, Madam Mariam, please kindly come and take over the chair.
Ok. Merci. Mesdames et Messieurs. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. After the presentation of uh, the GLPM program of the African Union Commission, the second session will look at gaps in protecting migrant workers in Africa. I would therefore like to invite Madame Barbara Anda, member of the Consultative Commission on Migration of um, Labor Migration representing women in transborder trade to join me on the rostrum. I would like to indicate to the attention of honorables that in West Africa, for example, women are main actors of transborder trade and they certainly face different challenges. I would also like to urge the presenter to make her presentation. We may, we would be forced to reduce it to 15 minutes maximum and that she should lay emphasis on what PAP can do, PAP can do, the role of PAP in handling these gaps and solving the problems inherent therein. Thank you, ma'am. You have the floor. Excusez-moi, je vais chercher un stylo. Honorable members of parliament in the Pan-African parliament, good afternoon. I'm sure now it's afternoon. All port protocols observed. Um, my name is Barbara Banda and I'm representing women in cross-border trade. I'm also representing she trades where I'm doing some work for the AFCFTA, uh, looking at the women in business associations in Southern Africa. I'm a gender and trade expert. So I will be making a presentation on um, gaps in women and men migrant workers protection in Africa. I want to recognize uh, AU Elmark for including women in cross-border trade as a constituency in looking at migration because the question would be, how does that fit in? But we know that these women are crossing borders. Uh, for example, uh, the EAC region, we did witness at those one border stop uh, points, how women carry their goods. And this talks to the issue of the protocol on free movement that uh, my brother Sabelo talked about. Four out of 55. That's an absurd situation, and that will be our point uh, of call in terms of what should PAP do. So I will premise from the fact that migrant workers matter. In a report by the World Bank, it shows that in 2021, uh, there were remittances in the Sub-Saharan Africa of $45 billion dollars an increase of 6.2%. This is a substantial figure or money to come into the region. But also that in terms of informal cross-border traders, 60% of regional trade in Africa uh, is contributing to 43% of income for Africans. This is a report that was done by Trade and Law uh, in a consultancy company in um, South Africa. So I'll look at existing protection mechanism and I'm, very going to, I'm going to be quite rapid because some of the issues have been covered by my colleague. What are the structural and systemic gaps in protection of migrant workers? The issue of decent work, and I'm going to talk from an experiential point of view I'm not coming from the AU, Aeromark Secretariat, I'm a practitioner. And I'll make some recommendation, what should you do as PAP? So in terms of the mechanisms, I've just put uh, 
I can see my presentation is not there, but I did elaborate on uh, existing frameworks, particularly at the international level. This is looking at really the robustness of governance in terms of labor migration. But the question is, all these instruments, what are we doing about it as uh, Africa? And we have heard from the AU point of view that these have been domesticated at AU level, but this need to come down to actually uh, the member countries. The issue of globalization, this is talking really to multinational companies. These are the people that attract labor. And we know that they have choices. They are choosing to move factories into places where they can actually produce cheaper. For example, they would go to Bangladesh, they would come to Africa, they would go to China and start producing at using cheap labor. Uh, the greatest inability of our generation, by this was by ILO, it's the inability to create jobs where people live. And that's one issue that as member states we need to be asking ourselves. Uh, the issue of global warming, increased inequalities, the issue of poor adoption of uh, policies, and these policies are available, but when we come in country, we can see that there is limited policy implementation and even the mechanisms to make sure that these policies are being enforced. So the main thing that we want to look at is uh, the issue of decent work and how does decent work uh, become practical. If operations are legalized, we are talking of decent work as work that is what happens before we send the migrants out of the country through the value chain. What are the systems in the sending country? How are they ensuring that migration is organized? And then when they go to the host country, how are we monitoring what happens to our national citizens? The issue of setting standards according to national guidelines, are the national guidelines available in our member states? Are they in a form that is accessible by the uh, migrants in terms of language, even in terms of where can they find this information. So if I'm looking for a job outside the country, where would I get information in terms of the human rights? And where would I get information about what to expect in the host country? The issue of ensuring human rights policies and safeguards are in place. This is a big issue because when we look at the fundamental rights, Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 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 So, I am in a program that has come out of uh, the AIRMAC, which is looking at decent work. And this program is being employed. We are starting with issues of setting up structures in country where the agents is identifiable. They are working. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, for uh, the work they do. And it is important that these agencies are also being monitored in terms of their staffing. Are they working with people who really understand what migration is all about. So that also takes me back to the idea of uh, what is driving illegal migration. So if legal migration is not being properly monitored in a way that is conducive even to the agencies, 
we start seeing these uh, clandestine institutions coming up, people uh, doing trafficking, literally. And then these issues, when they go bad in the host country. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Is that English channel? So it should be on B, not on A. Okay, all right, all good. Parade. And so the program that I am in, the staff are trained, there's branding of this organization so that even when these locals are going to the host country, they are identifiable. You go to the airport, you see them, and you see that they are, you can identify them as people who are going into another country carrying a, a brand name. And therefore, that reduces uh, the possibility of trafficking because how do you traffic people that can really show who they are. So even the police, the immigration at airports are able to deal with these people as they travel. And because these people are trained uh, even to handle international travel, you get to meet them, they are confident. They know where they are going. They know about the contracts that they have signed. And I want to quickly talk about the work that is being done by ITUC publishing the stories of what is happening in the GCC uh, in Qatar about how these migrants are living. These are horror stories. And I'm sure all of us here have come across uh, these uh, stories, but it becomes a routine. Nothing is happening. It's not making Africa change its course of doing things, uh, especially when we look at how are we dealing with intra or in, in intra-Africa migration. So, for example, in Qatar, how can a company in Qatar respect an African when a company in South Africa is not respecting one of its own? That becomes very difficult. So, um, they carry the, the day and they treat our people like rubbish. Uh, this, the conditions that these migrants are living in it's, it's things that uh, our parliamentarians should start really interrogating seriously. When decent work is uh, being promoted uh, properly, the host country is also benefiting because then from this labor, they're also able to do production. From this labor, they, they are able to meet uh, we know like Qatar 2022, the huge FIFA projects that are there at the moment. This is an opportune moment that Africa could have come together and said no to uh, irregular migration. So the onus is on Africa to start doing something about it. The recommendations. Legal protection for migration in the informal sector. The workers in the informal sector are more at risk of injury and disease than those in the formal sector. We saw this during COVID when our borders were shut down in countries where they were shut down. What we could see is that the big institutions that are formal could pass through the borders with big trucks called essential services. And yet the women that I'm working with carrying masks could not go through the same route because they were told the borders are closed. These women are also bringing essential services and it is high time that we recognized the contribution that they are making. At the beginning I said 43% contribution to livelihoods of African families. We need to end or reduce activities of organized criminals who exploit migrants and documented status. How can we uh, improve the issue of documentation? I'm coming from a country where the cost of a passport is almost $200, where even the availability of those passports is determined by the availability of foreign currency. Yet, if we are able to promote migration in a regular way, we will be getting remittances into the country. 
We need to ensure better safety and working conditions, including export of benefits. We need to guarantee minimum wages. I want to speak to the issue of contracts. These contracts uh, say one thing when uh, job seekers are signing up in their sending country. This is because, for example, in Qatar, for them to obtain a visa, the contract should show a certain level of wage for the incumbent. But when they get there, they are then told that this was done to make sure they get a visa. The actual wage, for example, they will say 400 is what the government requires. But when they get there, it's reduced to something like 200, 250. And uh, these migrants have no recourse. They just have to take that job. For them to get that $400 they borrowed, uh, they need to pay it back. So when they are in the host country, they are forced. There's a big issue that needs to be dealt with. Even ITUC, uh, that is an issue. We need to allow tax revenue and pension contributions. The issue of social protection and portability of benefits comes into play. Better access to health care. Our people are being injured and they are left to their own means without provision for medical attention, without provision for even transportation to get to hospitals. Provide access to legal recourse to protect migrant workers. In my work with Elmac, El we did come across a Chinese company in an African country with contracts in Chinese. How do the workers know what you are saying? What is the wage in that contract? How are we allowing such things to happen? Africa needs strong political leadership to bring about orderly migration. We therefore challenge our governments to address labor rights. The youth who are 226 million of the African population, 60% unemployed, they are asking, why are you spending on arms more than on production where you can create jobs? They are asking, why are you still signing up with IMF, with World Bank, that are capping wages in our countries, that are saying you cannot employ more teachers, you cannot employ more nurses that are really trained using taxpayers' money. It's up to our parliaments who are signing up these agreements. We need to domesticate international policy recommendations based on research and evidence. We need to consider bilateral, and this time we need to consider continental agreements to regulate the relevant issues if we go out as Africa negotiate for Africans, there will be a change because this is 55 countries that have got a population of 1.3 billion. Definitely, we can have a say. We need to increase private sector accountability in complying with labor regulations. Private sector is operating with impunity and it's because we allow them. Effective tripartite labor advisory councils. This has been talked about. And the promotion of uh, migration, labor market information systems, which is one of the uh, products that we are bringing in the projects that we are doing, because then that helps to track what is happening with these migrants. Right from the day you put them into the system, it means anyone in the system is able to see where is Barbara Banda, what is she doing, and how is she being remunerated. There is a control mechanism. And soon we are going to be celebrating the International Day of Decent Work on the 17th of August. My call is that we celebrate with the spirit of Ubuntu, putting people before profits, because their contributions to both sending and receiving countries are critical, are important. They are making a difference, I submit. Merci, merci. Thank you, Madam Brabanda, for your presentation.
I'm not going to summarize what you said, but let me just flag that she noted that migration is also a source of revenue for our states through the remittances done by the labor workers in their states. And she asked a question that is, what do we do with the various instruments that have been put in place by the African Union? Why they are so weakly uh, implemented? And then she focused on the legal protection of migrants in the informal sector, the right to decent housing, decent salaries, and social protection. We've got 15 minutes left for questions and answers. Let me take one single list of questions and then enable her to answer. Honorable Bini, the floor is yours. And <coughs> followed by the Gambia. Oui, Honorable Bini, vous avez la parole. Chair, Honorable Chair, Pemi Majudina from uh, South Africa. Chair, let me thank um, the the presenters, uh, even from the very the, the previous um, presentation. On this one, my focus is on uh, women in particular. That um, I did not hear anything that talks about um, equal job and equal pay, because this is one of the things that uh, expose women um, uh, to various things, and they don't get uh, uh, protection. Um, but also the issue of uh, women health rights and health needs that are not always uh, spoken to, if uh, those can be um, uh, attended to. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you, uh, Win. Okay, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to seize this opportunity to thank the various presenters. Introduce yourself. Please. I am Honorable Suleiman Sao from the Gambia. Um, the topic of discussion is very, very important. I have more of contribution. Um, Madam Chair, migration has been in Africa since time immemorial. And now what, is, what are we facing in our various countries? We have no respect for each other as Africans. We abuse each other. We demoralize each other. We dehumanize each other. And that's the fact of the matter. We must recognize ourselves as Africans and know that these boundaries were created by the colonialists to control us and dominate us. And we still continue to respect, give respect to those boundaries than humanity. Look at the EU, for example. If you belong to an EU um, union, you can move from one part of Europe to another without being harassed. What are we seeing from Gambia to Senegal, how close we are? Imagine an MP wants to go and attend a meeting. He stopped at the border for a laser passe for almost four hours. Couldn't attend a meeting. What kind of protocols are we, are we, are we, are we practicing as Africans? More so to the migrants. We give them all kinds of names, criminals, unwanted people. As, as, as the presenter rightly said, these people, there must be a standard set for them. We must measure, make sure that we have a proper data of migrants. They can be useful to our economy. But that's not the case. We've been seeing Africans killed in various countries by their fellow Africans. And our leaders are keeping quiet over it. Are we ready to move as a continent? So these are some of the issues. The stigma is so high. Stigmatization is, is, is so high. When I listen to both presenters, I nearly say tears. What can we do as representatives of the people? Uh, Madam Chair, these people, they don't have access to justice in various countries. Some are, some are under detention, as we are speaking. We have brothers in some countries, I will not mention right now, but they cannot have access to health facilities. They are infected with tuberculosis. Two of them die. The other two are struggling to survive. And it's happening in Africa. Honorable Chair, talking about trade. 
the protocols are there. But still now, you cannot get vegetables from one part of uh, continent to another part of, uh, one part of the continent to another. Why? And when we can export the best feces and vegetables to Europe, and Africans are still under you know, poor nutrition. So we must act now, and we must have legislations to, to, to make sure that you know, migrants are respected. This is my contribution. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My, my contribution is related to unratified protocols. We have this protocol. I don't know how they come about these protocols. Then when they go back, the, 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 the leadership go back to their countries, suddenly they don't want to ratify. Is it that these protocols are imposed on us? That when we come up with an idea to protect our people, to protect uh, the citizenry of Africa, but when it goes to an individual country, the country then decides not to ratify. Where is the missing link? Where are these protocols coming from? Are they our protocols? We agree on ratifying a protocol on migration as Africa. Then suddenly we have four countries out of 55 countries ratifying. Where is the problem? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson, uh, for giving me the floor. I am Honorable Amina from Chad. I say thanks to uh, two ladies for their presentation, which are benefit for us. I would like to focus on Africa migration in general. You know, as uh, mentioned at one of the presentators said, the level of uh, migration in Africa is not, the level is, uh, uh, is not uh, the same in different countries. Some countries, some countries the level is higher and other is a little low. My, my, my preoccupation is about some countries where the migration is higher. Most of youth uh, leave our country and uh, go, go to other country in, inside Africa. But unfortunately, those youth are discriminated, sometimes abused, sometimes get died. And most of uh, most of time we say it in Africa, one Africa, one voice. What is the role of the Parliament Africa to banish this discrimination and abuse inside our continent? In my point of view, we are uh, one continent, and Africa Union is there. What we wait when we wait to get the one passport in Africa. This, I think, can help uh, the youth to get easily to other countries for looking the better life. And about uh, the one lady mentioned the, about the uh, L, uh, GLMP is to principle of the need of identification and to eradicate poverty. We have uh, many job opportunities in our countries. For example, creating uh, domestic factories, can you reduce poverty? Why not lead our youth every time go to another country and they get die and discriminate? That's why my preoccupation and thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, my name is Ashine from Ethiopia. Uh, I would like to uh, give my thanks to the uh, uh, presenter. It was really a wonderful presentation. Uh, the issue of migration concerning Africa is always, uh, Africa is always considered as 
moving continent. If you have watched all the international medias, uh, looking at all what is propagated against Africa, the image of Africa is destroyed by all the depiction of the migration that our youth are moving out from Africa, driven by the issue of poverty, and instability, and all other chaoses in Africa. And I think one of the main things that should be focused is in, in, the, in, the, in the member states is how countries can retain the migrants from migrating from the countries to the other areas. And the, specifically, um, when the, the issue of uh, the women is so serious, uh, as a, a parliamentarian who come from Ethiopia, very proximate near to the Middle East, where our women are moving, you know, almost uh, every day. They are migrating for seeking a better job there. And the way they are treated is, is really bad. And I think one of the things that I didn't hear from the, uh, from the presentation is the right of women to education and training. The skills that are needed for women even to work. We have to train them. We have to give them the skills needed for, 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 for the workforce that we need. Uh, including in, a, in, any, in any country. They can be in any country, but we need to focus on educating women, training them so that, that they will have a skills uh, to, to go and work anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon to you all. Um, my contribution will be, um, at least, uh, I think we have to go back to our various uh, countries uh, to be more responsible of our own actions. Because previously, when you look at the um, continental migration, in two dec decades ago, women are not in the migration at a lot. But now, I think they are, we are committing about 50% uh, of the migration now. And by looking at that show, women migration diverse so many reasons from living behind poverty conflict of uh, climate or related disasters um, inequality abuses that also make them to migrate not even their intention but uh, something forced them to do so what are the mechanism in place and what can be in, in place to defend or to stop such a migration from the from the women uh, side and I think our countries must be doing so by promoting the stability and the education and the, uh, employment opportunity for women. By doing so, I think some of the, these unnecessary migrations will be, will be reduced. We cannot be continuing seeing, looking at our migration centers. Women will be abused. If they are financially bankrupt, their fellow men will be capitalized on those things. And sometimes they will be having producing on unwanted child, some of them, they will even uh, relinquish the kids to the detention centers. They will abandon their kids, and all these are affecting. It's all related to the uncertainty from our various countries. I think our government should be responsible to make sure that they put a serious mechanism. By leaving your country, you have to have a means to do so. When you are leaving, you have to know that you are going for a destiny whereby the government is not there. Is going to be on your own. But by doing so, wherever country they are, they also need to be protected. The human rights, fundamental rights should protect them there. They are not criminals. They are looking for greener pastures. So by doing so, I think it's a responsibility for our government so also to come up with a serious note, continental African law to make sure that all the immigrations, immig immigrants are protected wherever they are. The color of the country doesn't matter. Humanity matters what we are, we are doing right now. I think PAP has a responsibility. We have to trigger our governments, our various governments, to make sure that there's a serious ratification to protect the humanity, not only on the women and children's side, but the humanity itself needs to be protected. We need to have a single continental uh, travel document 
that will protect. You have a free movement from Africa. When you want to be in Europe, if you are European, you don't need any other document. The only passport you have that will guarantee you for, from point A to point B. So why not Africa? You want to travel from east or west, you have to go, to, uh, go through a visa process. If you don't get a visa, you can go. At least we should uh, honor ourselves and try to see ourselves as one individual in the same continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. My name is uh, Thank you, uh, Chairperson. My name is uh, Honorable Newton Samakai from uh, uh, Zambia. First and foremost, I would want to commend all the presentations that were made uh, this morning. They, they are all apt uh, to the points that are being um, discussed. Um, Madam Chairperson, my uh, observation is related to some of the questions that have been raised by uh, my colleagues in regard to uh, the uh, protocols uh, that have been, uh, some of them uh, signed, but not uh, domesticated in most of our countries uh, on the continent. Um, the question that I would want to put forward is that why can't the African Union uh, put in place a mechanism to sanction a countries that have not signed up and domesticated those um, uh, protocols which have been um, I agreed uh, at this uh, fora if indeed they, 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 they present advantages to uh, our countries. And I think further I would ask our management of, of PAP to assemble all the uh, protocols that have been signed up and those that have not been domesticated so that they could be given to all members of the PAP as a campaign for awareness in our countries. Thank you very much. Shukran gazilan, Madam Chair. My name is Randa Mustafa, Masriya Senator في مجلس الشيوخ المصري. الصورة كلها يعني ليست قاتمة بهذا الشكل. خليني أقول ماذا يحدث للمهاجرين. Is there translation? Translation is not coming. Okay, so I I will speak in English. Okay. My name is Randa Mustafa. I'm a senator in Egyptian Senate. And I want to give a, a, a good, uh, bright uh, uh, idea about what is going on with the immigrants, the African immigrants in Egypt. Uh, we have uh, a big group of students uh, studying in all our universities. We have a big students studying in Al-Azhar al-Sharif. We ha which is the uh, uh, Islamic uni big Islamic university. We have many, many labors in Egypt, and even the African labor uh, taking double the salary of the, Egy of the Egyptian labors. They can easily uh, come up with uh, a birth certificate in all uh, uh, the institutes for their, for their kids. So uh, the picture is not so dark to this extent. This is, I'm telling, uh, uh, an experience of my country. So yes, maybe there is some uh, difficulties in other countries, but let's also take the good example of, uh, of uh, uh, dealing with uh, those uh, uh, immigrants. Thank you very much.
Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je suis... Madame la Présidente, merci beaucoup. Je suis l'honneur de l'honneur de Kina, de Mauritius. I chaired the uh, Health and Social Affairs Committee here at the Pan-African Parliament. Let me begin my intervention by thanking the two presenters for the brilliant presentations they made today. Now, in the concept note that was shared with us, Mr. Madam Chair, and the statistics mentioned on uh, labor migration in Africa, 26 million, it's mentioned, of international migrants for 2019, and then 20.3 million uh, working of working age, which means that there are about 6 million of youth and children who are not, uh, who have not reached the age of majority where they can work. So I'm wondering then, where are these children and young people coming from? And it it appears that they are even more vulnerable because they do not have the required documents. So in terms of gender disaggregation as well, have we been able to identify uh, ways of indicating the gender disaggregation? Do Can we say that the free movement, even though it is a positive the situation, it does indirectly affect uh, the problems of forced labor of children and uh, illicit trade in children and women as far as sex workers is concerned. Thank you very much. I've been told that we've not much time left. I will take two interventions now. One lady and one gentleman, please. The lady over there, please go ahead. Followed the gent by the gentleman at the back. So just two, please. You after. Yes. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Madam Barbara. Banda as well for the very interesting presentation she made. To add to what my colleague, Honorable Franco Carr, what you've said, uh, let me continue in the same vein and add that when we talk about the modern slave trade, this practice is common. We are aware of this. There is the child prostitution. There, there's also the issue of children who migrate to other countries and they sometimes end up uh, working in the prostitution sector, and we should call this out. In Mauritius, we have many students who come from the African continent. Uh, the majority of the students are from Africa, many in Middlesex University in the western part of the island, where Mauritius welcomes foreign students from other African countries, but often during the weekend or when they are on break at the end of the month to try and bridge the financial gap, they work illegally. Uh, so in Mauritius, we have many foreign workers from India and Bangladesh and from the African continent. Now, these foreign workers, generally speaking, are well supported, they are legal, they are structures in place to assist them, to help them find work. So they're regular workers, and they can also address the Ministry of Labor when they feel that their uh, rights are being infringed upon. So I'm wondering, in other regions of Africa, what is the situation as regards these uh, structures to provide as assistance? I'm from the Mauritian Parliament, as I said. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. I have a question that comes up very often, which I would like to pose here. We have international treaties in place. And for those who went to the Bern conference, there was also the partition of Africa, which came up, and what rights 
affected those who participate in this have? Legal practitioners are saying that all the decisions that were taken at the Berlin conference, I beg your pardon, not Berlin, Berlin conference should be annulled. And so I'm wondering what the African Union is doing to promote the concept of One Africa, One Voice. Thank you. Alors, je vais, je vais passer la... Thank you very much. Let me give the floor to the presenter. Uh, obviously, she cannot answer all the questions. She said she's not from the African Union, so maybe we can continue the discussions later. Madam, you have the floor. Uh, thank you for your responses. I think a lot of uh, the contributions were really uh, contributing to what can be done by PAP, which we welcome very much, and it shows the message has gotten home. Uh, the issue of equality, uh, equality of pay, uh, women health rights and needs from Honorable from South Africa, I think it's a very pertinent question, and what I can just say there is the issue that was really brought about also by another contributor about the right for education. This happens in the top end of the ladder of employment where you are looking at skilled workers who can negotiate contracts. And we know that now it's about giving skills to those who are looking for jobs for them to be able to negotiate. But also we know like uh, these lower level jobs the, the issue of equality of pay is not an issue, really. Um, I think uh, the contribution from Honorable from Zimbabwe, I think it's a question to up. Where are the missing links? Are the protocols uh, imposed on you? Uh, those are issues to take back home. The issue uh, also is about the last contribution about uh, the, the Berlin Conference. Again, uh, we can see that the responses, the answers are within the parliamentarians in Africa. So basically, uh, we appreciate that uh, you can see where we are coming from, the frustrations that we are e experiencing in terms of uh, regular migration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Merci. Je voudrais juste relever... I would like to raise some of the important issues that came up related to PAP. Let's come back to some of the questions. Why are the protocols not ratified? Why is the protocol not ratified by member states? And this is a valid question. Firstly, we need to know whether the Pan-African Parliament is included in the process of drafting these protocols. We are asked to promote them. We represent our citizens, but these protocols, have they been drafted only by the technicians? What was the role of the Pan-African Parliament in the drafting of these uh, protocols? We cannot be asked to promote them if we actually don't know what they entail and if we've not even contributed to them. That's the first issue. And then secondly, when we speak of the functions of PAP, our role as PAP is to carry forward the voice of the African populace in, in ensuring that their, their voices are heard in drafting of these policies, these instruments. So we also should be supervising. And I'm wondering if the, if the African Union has followed the appropriate uh, structures and in, in drafting these policies, these protocols. There have been many questions on the protocol uh, on my migrants. The issue of whether women's rights have been taken into account in the protocol, the rights of migrants in the informal sector, has that been included in the protocol? So this means, in my opinion, if we must play a primary role in this protocol, which is of the utmost importance for all of our countries, we should begin to consider reviewing this or revising this protocol to uh, better localize it in our different countries. This, If there are gaps, if there are issues to be addressed, if there are missing elements, then we would need to address this. We can go back to the African Union Commission and tell them that if we must 
play our role in promoting these conventions, this protocol in particular, we should be better informed, first of all, and we need to ensure that the rights of women and that's of labor migrants in the informal sector are taken into account. So these are the issues I thought needed to be emphasized. Thank you very much to you. Thank you to our presenter, Barbara Banda. Thank you so much. Could I remind the members of the Gender Committee, Gender, Family, Youth and the Disabled, that we have a meeting at 2 p.m. in Committee Room 3. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Member, for moderating that, this uh, session. And uh, thanks to Ms. Barbara Banda. Uh, please, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, I know you have been very patient. We started late. Uh, but uh, we could also add a few minutes so that we complete this particular session. And then thereafter, we break off for lunch. If you, if, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. So um, we'll ask now the chairperson of uh, a Committee on Justice and Human Rights, uh, Honorable Jamari, to come forward and moderate the next session. There are two presentations, but I hope they will be very brief, and then we can have extra time to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. As you've seen, we need to adjourn. We've not uh, many comments that have come through, uh, Vice President of PAP, Honorable Colleagues. Ladies and gentlemen, our invited guests, I greet you this afternoon. Good afternoon to you all. So I was saying, uh, you have noted that we are a little behind schedule. As has been said, we have other items to consider, so we will try to work as we are used to, because you are fully aware that members of parliament never get tired. When we have work to do, we have to rally the troops uh, and steady ourselves for the work ahead. So. I would like to advocate that we use the legal instruments. We, we consider the advocacy for the use of legal instruments, the role of the Pan-African Parliament in the African Labor Migration Advisor Committee. We need to focus on the best practices, the obstacles, difficulties, and we need to find innovative solutions to improve the level of ratification so that the relevant legal instruments are integrated uh, in or, or harmonized to ensure that they can be implemented at national level. So I have no additional comments to make here, but rather I would like to move quickly and request the first speaker to take the floor on this theme. You have the floor. Uh, is it uh, K. Umar? Business Africa, I believe you're the first presenters. I would like to invite you to take the floor. Please, you're most welcome. You followed closely, and I think right from the outset you've been here with us, and so you know that we only give 15 minutes maximum to the presenters. So we're handing over the floor to you, please. You're welcome. And uh, honorable members of uh, Pan-African Parliament, as well as the stakeholders and members of the Labor Migration Advisory Committee, good afternoon. 
My name is Dickens Ouma, and uh, I'm here to represent Madam Jacqueline Mugo, who is the General Secretary of Business Africa. About Business Africa, this is a platform for engagement in continental, regional, and sub-regional socioeconomic policy and discussions. There are 45 national uh, employers' organizations uh, across Africa who are members of Business Africa. Of the nine national employers' organizations not in Business Africa, Somalia, Burundi, and South Sudan have already established working relationship with Business Africa. And uh, I want to say this right at the onset. Being um, an employer's organization, a continental employer's organization, I want to say that productivity at the workplace knows no nationality. One will not say that this was made well because the worker was an immigrant. So we look at the qualitative approach at the workplace. The goal of Business Africa is to constantly enhance the growth of business and creation of employment and wealth in Africa. You know, it's difficult to give this discussion, especially after distinguished speakers, and that was uh, capped by Madame Banda. I nearly stood up to say that, well, I totally agree with her and have nothing useful to add. But we have to give the perspective from the employer's body also. Why Business Africa? This is because Business Africa as, in, uh, as an institution is the voice of business, that is, of employers at the continental level. Business Africa's strategy is to advocate for policies and actions that lead to conducive business environment that both protects the welfare of workers, supports growth, profitability and sustainability of business enterprises and accelerate the development of Africa. Now the Business Africa position on migration is that the movement of people and goods is the bedrock of economic, social and cultural developments in Africa. Africa is strong when it's united and when the policy environment and political rhetoric supports the citizens of Africa to acquire skills, move and reside anywhere in Africa where they can be fully productive. Advocacy for the use of the legal instruments and which is the core presentation that we have this morning is that Labor Migration Advisory Committee of which uh, Business Africa is a member deliberate on best practices, critical barriers and challenges, as well as identifying innovative solutions to increase ratification and domestication of relevant legal instruments. From the employer's perspective, and you know, when you talk of an employer's body, particularly when it comes to issues labor, then what instantly comes to mind is tripartism. You know, the tripartite partnership has its bedrock and main pillar being social dialogue. So social dialogue becomes key to successful ratification, domestication, and implementation of various continental policy and legal frameworks. Uh, social dialogue, ladies and gentlemen, leads to ownership. It leads to appreciation of realities on the ground. And most importantly, it ensures a win-win framework in terms of legislation as well as policy formulation. 
Tripartism, as I said, is important. This should be strengthened across Africa. Government should not just be talking to themselves. You know, if I take an example of certain strides we've made in, uh, you know, breaking the border barriers when it comes to trade, then this, from a social uh, dialogue perspective, must involve this uh, key stakeholders. The government cannot go it alone. The tripartite partners must be part and parcel of this journey because that is when ownership will come in for successful implementation. The private sector and trade unions, therefore, should be part and parcel of this because they are not enemies of partner states, but rather stakeholders, social partners in that respect. Now, there's the aspect of simple, predictable, and coordinated policy and legal framework, and which is very important. Let the policies be matched by actions. The partner states need to walk the talk. For example, if the policy says it is free movement of persons, goods, and services, then the practice on the ground should just be that. Businesses and investment will thrive and help address the socioeconomic challenges in Africa if the environment is predictable. And therefore, this calls for commitment to implementation and actualization of long-term uh, continental strat uh, strategy, and the plan is key. The member states are at different level of, de of development. That one is, cannot, be, uh, uh, cannot be disputed. But commitment to the continental aspirations should include national efforts to approximate the national laws and practices to continental frameworks, even if ratification has not yet happened. And this happened in several jurisdictions. I, I know even from my own country, which is Kenya, there are certain um, uh, conventions that have not been uh, ratified. But I can tell you as a legal practitioner that we have domestic laws that are all allied to those conventions. So there is need uh, for them to be ratified. And this is, it calls for charity beginning at home. I call upon you, honorable members, in your respective parliaments to push this agenda so that we walk on the same uh, uh, level. The mindset adopted at all levels should be that we as one people and frameworks and policies adopted should make the weak member states strong and the strong member states stronger. We also have a weak formal private sector and exp expanding informality as a manifestation of policy and legal frameworks out of touch with these realities. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is that if you make it hard for persons to move legally, they begin to move in an informal way. Member states have to choose what they want for Africa. In doing business legally, if doing business legally becomes very expensive, then the business continue to be done, but informally. That is the truth of the matter. If laws are complex, safe, and orderly, regular and humane, labor migration becomes hard. What then happens? The resultant effect would be irregular and undocumented mig uh, migration. We also have to instit institutionalize continental engagement structures at the African Union. And this calls for engagement structures and platforms which should not be left at the mercy of donors and development partners. The member states should invest in them, and there must be specialized technical committees which should be strengthened. Pan-African parliament committees should be open to engaging continental bodies. Business Africa and trade unions on various pieces of legislation and policies that they are considering. Labor migration, trade, air transport, and security require a unified continental approach. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa should be united in action, policy, and demand for better pay, 
working and living conditions and dignity for our people working in the Gulf, Asia, Europe, and North America. Africa's trade with the rest of the world should be guided with uh, AFCFTA. Each member state should have a product that they have exclusive rights for African markets. Talking of strategy. This will ensure that 55 products of our people consume, uh, the 55 products that our people consume are supplied 100% from Africa. This will unleash massive economic transformation and wealth and employment creation in Africa. The fragmented approach to the continent's security only leads to weaknesses uh, at the continental level. Coordinated and united approach to security of the continent is key for stability. Instability anywhere in Africa should be a concern of the whole of Africa. This way, Africa will be able to protect her heritage and resources. As I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, concerted efforts and goodwill found in the economic blocks with reference to trade should be replicated in labor movements across borders and have local, regional, and ultimately continental legal and policy instruments harmonized. Africa will realize its continent, uh, continental potential through continental pot potential through this route. Because as I said earlier on, productivity at the workplace knows no border nor nationality. I thank you very much. Uh, merci. Merci. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. You were very, you were straight to the point, and this enabled us to understand. Without much ado, I will. Well, uh, that what was supposed to be the second presenter, was it? Did we, what, did we plan for a second presenter? I think we had two themes. Am I wrong? Somebody correct me, please. Joel Odeji, Kick Africa. Is that, am I right? Good morning, and uh, good morning to, uh, uh, it's the afternoon actually, uh, to everyone, but where I am is still morning. Uh, the name of Kato Joel Odije, the Deputy General Secretary of the African Regional Organization of the International Tribunal Confederation. So I'll be speaking to member of PAP as uh, a, a, a voice for one of your critical uh, constituency workers, uh, organized labor, uh, ITUC Africa, and I'll be speaking on behalf of ITC Africa and the Organization of African Trade Unity. Uh, Brother Omar talked about uh, the essence of uh, tripartism. So for ITUC Africa and Organization of African Trade Union Unity, what country? We are the organized labor uh, uh, constituencies in the uh, Labor Migration Advisory Committee of the African Union, uh, who is uh, advising member states on issues of labor migration. And when we talk about labor migration, of course, we know we are talking about workers. So we will be speaking on behalf of our members to their different uh, representatives in the various African countries. And uh, between our both organizations, we have members in all 54 um, member states. And uh, for, for my organization, we represent uh, 18 million uh, membership in men and women on the continent of Africa. I, I, will, I, will, I will speak very quickly because uh, for time, and secondly, because quite a number of the things I will say have been said by others. 
So I do not want to uh, bother uh, you, but to repeat. But clearly, um, in terms of setting the scene uh, for our, under, uh, uh, our appreciation, uh, the issue around is agreed that this is a historical phenomenon and that human beings as humans will always move. And that is when you talk about movement, mobility, there is a question of rights that is embedded and grade in it. And that um, we have seen globally that migration offers benefits to everybody concerned. In other words, to the economies, uh, countries of origins, transit countries, and countries of destinations or host country, as the case may be. And uh, as uh, organized labor, there is no migration crisis, uh, and there is no labor migration crisis as, as such. But what we have is a governance a crisis of migration. In other words, we are not able to manage the governance issues very well. And that's why it is what it is. With COVID-19, quite a number of issues have come up very clearly that we demand the attention of PAC in terms of policy um, leg uh, uh, legislations uh, in terms of rulemaking that needs to enhance the right of uh, uh, persons on the move uh, better. Uh, we are also seeing, and as uh, representatives, uh, you are politicians. We are seeing on the continent that uh, politicians are using migration as a, as a cheap tool uh, to gain popularity and to divide people in a way that it ought not to be. Uh, but we have also seen that uh, these persons are able to do so because, by and large, we are seeing quite a number of African states. In other words, you are, you are seeing increased governance deficits in one country, um, and then citizens, of course, can't stand it. They have to move, and when they move to other places, uh, we begin to hear this talk about people have come to take our jobs, people have ability, our security, uh, those crises are there. Lastly, we want to say that, that when we talk about migration, it's not a security issue. Uh, so you don't have to securitize migration in a way that uh, when you make the law, it is internal affairs dealing with it and every other ministries or agencies at second uh, rate. And we say this because we can point to countries where they have shown us clearly that migration is not a security issue. In other words, it doesn't pose risk, quote and unquote, to, my, uh, to, the def, uh, to insecurity. In other words, when you have uh, security issues, they are always internal, and there are rules to deal with it internally. Rwanda is a clear case of how, when you look at uh, migration as a security issue, uh, uh, as not a security issue, you find that uh, even while there are challenges with, it, with, with that country internally and externally, uh, Rwanda has never closed itself to people coming in. And uh, Rwanda has even had quite a number of uh, progressive policies to make uh, people want to come. But of course, that is not to say for some of us, we are happy or excited about the Rwanda approach uh, with the United Kingdom about uh, bringing repatriated uh, persons or Africans to Rwanda. That is another uh, issue entirely that we might need to look at, even including PAP, having to look at that at the level of legislation. It's not how we want to, uh, to go. But lastly, I would say ratification is very, very key. When we have governance, you need... Uh, it's, it's, it ought to be rule-based, rule-governed, uh, uh, and uh, standards are the basis of doing so. And when we talk about standards, it is helpful to look inward first uh, on our continent, Africa, and, and we look at what exists, what uh, treaty obligations have we entered into as uh, Africans with the international community that we ought to respect. And respecting them, it means we are domesticating them. And the more importantly, we are applying them. We are enforcing them when they are not uh, respected. Um, so those are the, uh, the background contests I would like to, uh, to lay. And uh, of course, also to say, these days, when we talk about labor migration, and I use uh, COVID-19 
uh, going forward to say that more and more of that, we see challenges of labor migration with more with women and with more with young persons. I made the point earlier that people will continue to move. Uh, and that when people move ordinarily, uh, it is more labor migrate, migration oriented because you find that the least you find when people move is that you find 80% of those persons ready to want to work, to want to do something to earn a living. Uh, either they want to set up small business to uh, generate revenue for themselves and to do so. Even when in extreme cases, when they are internally displaced or when they are refugees, we have found that, that uh, jobs, jobs, work has become the heart of human dignity. People seldom want to uh, accept handouts. And so they want to work to generate handouts. And so why is we look at labor migration uh, issue, our point, our first uh, position is that labor migration should be zero sum. It shouldn't be that uh, people are forced to leave. People should make it as a decision to want to leave, not forces pushing them or compelling them. But when you have high unemployment, very poor wages, very thin social protection provisions, the absence of human and labor rights, uh, high political uh, persecution, high state of uh, uh, violence and security, then people are likely to want to move to safe uh, events or uh, to more prosperous uh, uh, co uh, community. But lastly, is to say that for Africa uh, and for PAP, uh, the idea of how it can contribute to the actualization of Agenda 2063 is critical. And one of the areas of uh, the, the flagships of Agenda 2063 is the integration of Africa. And, to, and it means, uh, at the end, Africans being able to move within their continent. It means a new kind of governance that uh, uh, prides itself about solidarity and uh, look at what it means when it's talking about when there is a discussion around uh, sovereignty. How do you manage sovereignty against uh, 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 solidarity? In, you know, how do we advance the consciousness of uh, the Ubuntu essence, the Ubuntu as spirit? It is important because when we give it exclusively as sovereignty, we be uh, uh, my uh, uh, citizens versus other African citizens, uh, which might negate the Ubuntu essence and the essence of solidarity. But when we begin to look at uh, what kind of solidarity arrangement can exist, then we can do something better. I had the, the I have forgotten the, uh, the parliamentarian from which country, but he talks about shouldn't there be a sanction for member, for member states uh, when we don't uh, ratify what we ought to? Uh, uh, in a way, uh, it will have looked nice, uh, but we know the, Afri the African Union use more persuasion tools than uh, 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 sanctions. Sanctions, uh, why it has used. Uh, our experience has shown that it has been on extreme measures, especially on issues of uh, the deficit around democracy uh, and, uh, and governance. Has been, it has been a sudden, uh, suddenly used in terms of sanction. Uh, but then what you find is that, uh, interrogating is you find that the African Union should have also been able to do more on value. Uh, when I say value to the aid, the African Union, as, a, as it is today, and the path and all of that, is driven more by geography. In other words, we are all in Africa. We are all Africans, and so we are members of this organization. But we are not member of the African Union because we subscribe to the values of the African Union. And this is where I would say uh, to us that if it works, we can borrow it. The European Union, uh, Europe is has geography. But European Union is not driven by geography, it is driven by values. You must subscribe to certain values of the EU before you become a member. So perhaps that is one of the things PAP will also, by way of legislation, begin to think through. Well, if it helps uh, the e EU, maybe this is something we can uh, look at. Uh, quickly, uh, comrade uh, parliamentarians, when we talk about migrant uh, labor migration, it's clearly 
uh, the issues of rights. And I'm happy to uh, see just exactly the way parliaments work in our countries. That's the way the African, uh, the African, uh, the Pan African uh, Parliament structure committees. So the committees on uh, freedom of association, the committee on human rights, uh, the committee on labor, as it were, uh, we should take interest uh, in some of these issues. That when we talk about migration, labor migration, we are essentially looking at rights issues. And I've talked about uh, some of the rights issues that have come up recently. Uh, and I'm using COVID-19 moving forward. I want to be quick about it. First, uh, occupational health and safety issues have become very critical going forward. Uh, and so linked to that is how much of it in all categories, uh, in areas of our work, people uh, uh, get uh, personal protective equipment, including migrants. Those of our migrants uh, in our countries and those of our nationals going outside, how much of it? We have seen that there is an issue of restriction. You can't go. This is how you must go. The visa regime has been used as a tool of restriction. And unfortunately, amongst ourselves, we still have that uh, restriction. Uh, I can say for myself, uh, maybe from my tune, you will understand. I would have also loved to be with you uh, physically. But for the visa regime situation on our own continent, I couldn't uh, do that physically because I live in Togo as a Nigerian. If I have to get a visa to South Africa, I must go to I must go to uh, the Republic of Benin to get the visa before I, I can travel. And it takes a bit of five uh, working days. That restriction uh, is an issue. But it's even it's even worse for labor migrants outside our continent, particularly those. In if the the day minute, far west. If you make hotel, if you rest a day minute. Story, please. If you rest a day minute, you're left with. With two minutes, you have two minutes left, please. Two minutes left. Okay. Uh, what I will say, what I will say is that I have a, I have a, the presentation I have sent. Uh, I, I thought it was fifteen minutes I, I was given, and I was timing myself in that fifteen minutes. Um, to say two things, the challenges are, are there. There are structural issues. There are issues of insecurity. Uh, the issue of secu uh, securitization I've talked about. We have a weak uh, coherence at the national and regional level in terms of how we work with organizations, uh, government institutions. We will need to work on that. Uh, then there, there is weak reporting. When states, member states ratify certain conventions uh, and they domesticate them, reporting on the obligation of implementation has been very weak. And we think capacity uh, support for member states to help to uh, do that. And then there are cases where we have perception of very good national laws as against uh, um, uh, policy. So if my law is better at the country level, why do we have to ratify? Uh, 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 you do that because at the end, you just align it with your national uh, 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 law. Uh, so those are some of the challenges, but innovative ways because of time. Um, we want to see how much, how much more uh, uh, PAP also can be supported to appreciate first all legal instruments that are related to labor migration and get them within the relevant committees to also work with. The AU will be in a better position to do this. This will help um, very much uh, uh, well. But if we don't have a functional or improved uh, administration of the rule of law in our country, uh, it's, uh, especially on the issue of uh, ratification and application will be weak. Advocacy is central. This is what we are going to PAP. We think PAP should also take this to members of the executive arm uh, when they get to home to see what needs uh, 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 to, to, to be done. We want to do, uh, we, we, we say for Africans, can we have skills development on our continent in a way that we can leverage in internally. What are the skill deficits in Africa? And how can we improve the skills amongst ourselves so that our people can move within themselves and work and live in harmony in a way uh, that will work? Social partners have talked about it, support for capacity building 
could be also important. Then on, uh, we could use reservation for ratification. In other words, a country doesn't want to ratify, it takes it, it seeks uh, reservation. But in terms of uh, implementation, it has ways of implementing it without necessarily disagreeing with the of, uh, of that uh, piece of uh, legislation. There is a peer review. Can we do peer review in terms of how we have done this? NEPAD is, obvious, is uh, explicit on how we can do peer review. And in best practice, I will quickly show one example here, and I will stop. Between Rwanda and Benin Republic, there was a, good, a very good peer review uh, to the point that the president of Benin visited Rwanda and saw how Rwanda is applying migration issues, including labor migration policies. The president went back home on, on the base of review. The president of Benin Republic took away visa uh, regime for Africa. And so, so as we speak, in Benin, it will come and it's time. The same thing when you want to work. The procedures for working in that country are also uh, uh, progressive. Can we begin to peer review ourselves in a way that we can uh, achieve more of this uh, kind of uh, rati ratification? But much more, please, for liberal migration uh, policies and instruments, we will recommend that members of the committee look at normless. Normless is an ILO tool of engagement online. All member states present. It tells you how many instruments your countries have ratified, which one they have not ratified. It, show, it shows you the level of implementation and what needs to be done to improve it. And if you need assistance to do it more, if you see the ILO office, the ILO office will readily provide you the support for uh, helping to uh, bring up your capacity for reporting on this. Uh, legislation. I think if we do uh, on some of these things as uh, member states, we will have improved the um, the, the industrial uh, the um, legislative uh, environment for the continent. I, I want to thank you, uh, Chair, and I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, Sebu, Senuki, we equally thank you for the wonderful presentation you just uh, did. Without much ado, Honorable MPs, you all listened that uh, productivity at the job site doesn't make any difference between migrants and that people ought to be treated the same way it's necessary to create an enabler environment at the job site to ensure growth and productivity. And this should certainly be part of those treating or dealing with migrants. And we were also called upon as a parliament to work with the African Union to fast track some ratifications. And we just learned that governance on migration should be based on the rules. If there are no rules, you all agree with me that it will be very challenging. Without much ado, therefore, I will give the floor. Uh, to uh, our colleagues for intervention. I would start with the uh, president of the chairperson of the Trade Committee or Committee on Trade. So thank the two presenters uh, for eloquently presenting the two themes, uh, the two topics. Um, I, I was asking for, I asked for my intervention mainly to uh, talk about uh, uh, a statement made by the second presenter. Uh, I just wanted to mention that Rwanda is one of the few African countries with a, a progressive migration, migration policy. Uh, in the sense that uh, Rwanda is one of the four countries in Africa that allows Africans to receive their visa on arrival. 
uh, and I think that is quite progressive. Uh, two, uh, he talked about the issue of uh, Rwanda being uh, one of the few countries that have uh, received the migrants, particularly from uh, Libya. Uh, as you are well aware, the migrants from Libya, uh, like it was mentioned earlier alone, have actually gone to that country uh, through an arrangement of trafficking. And they are mistreated. Many of them have actually lost their lives. Uh, so Rwanda has played a very significant role in bringing them over to, to Rwanda. And they, when they come, they receive, uh, uh, they are provided training in different skills. Uh, they are also provided health care, among other things. But they are also assisted to continue looking for asylum uh, in a more dignified manner. And I want to state here that uh, majority of them have actually moved on to other countries as they had intended to. So uh, when you talk about the UK uh, uh, agreement between uh, Rwanda and, uh, and the UK, sincerely speaking, when you look at uh, the way the migrants are being treated in, uh, you know, in those uh, water, I mean, large ocean, I mean, the ocean, they are they, I think the Atlantic Ocean, they, they are terribly mistreated. And many of them have lost their lives. So if you ask anyone, what is the other alternative? And Rwanda is providing an alternative uh, to the extent that uh, these people will come to Rwanda, they will be provide the same treatment like those that uh, have been uh, brought in from Libya and other countries, uh, and they will be assisted to look for asylum, but in a more dignified manner. And they will be provided with health care, they will be provided with skills. Uh, and so uh, I think it is not uh, reasonable to criticize uh, without looking at the details of the agreement. So that is my comment, but otherwise I thank the presenters for the very good contributions. Thank you so much. I can see another hand there, please you. Um, Chair, Honorable Chairperson, my only contribution is the conveners or those who have come up with this um, workshop or discussion that we are holding now. What can they do to include the members of parliament, um, the Pan-African parliament to some form of uh, platform that we continuously engage so that we deal with this migration issue? We really feel for our people when we see them struggling, dying in the ocean, treated like animals, we really feel bad. So how can we be directly um, involved in some form of platform that we continue to engage some of the presenters in their various capacities to ensure that our people are treated with dignity? Yes. Hello. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want, uh, like my colleagues have said, I want to commend members, um, the presenters who have given us more detailed uh, submissions about uh, uh, this important uh, subject. Mr. Chairman, we are talking about uh, ratification. I want to interest uh, myself to the issue of goodwill majority or many countries that have uh, attempted to ratify, uh, there is a lot of debate on goodwill. How ready are they to implement uh, uh, these ratifications? The most important matter now across Africa is not about the law. We may have the law but the quality of the implementation. We are looking at very many uh, 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 Africans moving from border to border suffering. We are talking about uh, labor mobility being very difficult. We wouldn't be having so much discussion about this. Why, why, why should it be very difficult for us to travel within our own continent? Why should it be really a tug of war for one to come from one country to another to do, to, be, to do business, to offer service, to share a skill, why would it be like that one? I think the most important uh, part now here, Mr. Chairman, is the goodwill 
how ready are we as Africa to take on this particular uh, problem? We are talking about implementation of law, policy, principles, and uh, these protocols. We, we as Africans, we as member countries, we need to be ready. We need to exhibit our readiness to see that these things work out. Because we want to have something that can really work out. We are looking at many countries having challenges. We are now seated looking at how do we get the best out of us. We are looking at the quality. The quality of the population also matters, Mr. Chairman. The quality of the workers. Fine, we have the workers. The other colleague was talking about the uh, uh, workers going to do uh, uh, in, in, in plantations. We're working, we're having workers moving from one country to another, just doing petty, petty work. We are, we, yet we would be having a, a system of creating more opportunities. And then we see how we set uh, the, the African continent at its best. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, Mr. Chairman. I'm at your left here. I see you, Desi Melange. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, I arise, oh, okay, my, my name is Amos. His name is Masondo. I'm the chairperson of the National Council of Provinces uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, I, I rise to, to raise two, two, two points. The first is that uh, I would like to uh, uh, endorse and support uh, the idea that has been raised by Honorable Togaregi from uh, Zimbabwe uh, in relation for the need to, to deepen our debate uh, and to work out ways and means of ensuring that uh, uh, we take this debate that is taking place in this committee, uh, of course, to plenary, uh, but also to overall work of the of 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 of, of PAP. Secondly, to 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 request that uh, all the slides uh, as well as the presentations that have been made here should be made available to 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 all participants. Uh, that would go a long way in assisting other related and relevant uh, processes. Thank you very much. I'm here. Yeah. To your extreme right, if you can see me. Apanoma. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank okay, you, sorry, sir. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you, sir. OK. Well, Hello, Chairman, colleagues. I think that. If you observe all the discussions we have had, sorry, my name is Joseph Oseusu, um, a member of parliament from Ghana. If you listen to all the discussions we have had, at our level, at the official level, there's no problem at all with any of the things we are talking about, cooperation, free movement, um, ratification. The real challenge from my observation, is that we have not moved the discussion from our level to the everyday people level. And therefore, the people to people connection that will make free movement easy is a big challenge. I'm from West Africa, so I can speak to what happens within the West African uh, communities. Movement between people living in Togo and Ghana is so frequent that if you go to Accra today, probably the most talked about are the artisans from Togo. They are respected, they are loved, they are employed freely by everyday people because they are known and accepted as very good working with their hands in construction, in building, um, and in carpentry. Between Ghanaians and Burkinabes, between Ghanaians and Ivorians, between Burkinabes and Togolese, there's so much interaction that whatever we do at the executive and, and, and parliamentary level 
will not change that. It is that kind of people-to-people -people connection that I see as missing in many of the challenges that I, I read about, I see. I think what it calls for is a deliberate effort at promoting people-to-people -people connection, education, and orientation of our people to accept and work with um, people who move from other countries. I'm sure that everybody who has studied West Africa will see that it is one of the most successful um, groups in, in the continent because mm -hmm. truly there has been many years of people-to-people -people movement and what we do as legislators, as government, is only to regularize or bring into fruition, put it into law, what is it that the people uh, do among themselves. I think that is the way to go. Facilitating and encouraging our people to develop the people-to-people -people connection, starting their own trade, their own businesses, without necessarily needing governments to push them. I thank you. Uh, merci. Thank you. I see no hand raised, therefore let me give the floor first to Aline. Aline, the speaker, please, can you take the floor? Oh, thank you. I think there's a technical glitch here. The speaker is on the call. Ah, come on, the power on Pekoma Saparvu. Start by you. The floor is yours. Honorable members, thank you very much for your interventions. Um, I understand Honorable Joseph from Ghana to be laying emphasis on social integration as the starting point. And I totally agree with that. Um, let me say this, and this is my personal experience, and, and thank you very much, uh, the chairperson of the Trade Committee, uh, for using the words that the last presenters eloquently made their presentation. You all, for those of you who are there, and I'm sure most of you are there, in the late 70s and early 80s, the Republic of Uganda had a lot of problems. Uh, my brother from uh, Republic of Uganda is here. Kenya is not represented because, you know, we just had elections the other day. The new members have not been sworn in. But during the tumultuous period in Uganda, there was free cross-border labor into Kenya. In two schools that I attended in high school, I was actually taught by Ugandans. One of my English teachers, Dr. Opira, I'm still in communication with him up to now. So the eloquence that you talk about actually came from Uganda. When I cross the border and come there, Please treat me uh, with, you know, like a brother. I belong to you. So, so this is a testimony of what free labor movement in Africa can do to us. It produced, in the fullness of time, a young man from the lakes of Victoria and who was written to be, uh, was risen to be in the premier, you know, African Employers Organization Business Africa. And I'm, I'm sure there are many stories that could be said with respect to that. I'm just wondering if this happened in the 80s and early 90s with no proper uh, you know, laws, what has suddenly happened in Africa? Ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, let's take this from our domestic parliaments and as uh, rightly suggested by the second speaker, I cannot, I've forgotten the name, let Pan-African Parliament get involved 
not at the subcommittee level, but at the plenary level. This is the message that the Employers Organization Africa wishes to deliver to this distinguished house. I thank you very much. Thank you for the clarifications she provided. Without further ado, let me invite the next speaker. I'm struggling with the connection. Um, just to say that, just to reiterate uh, two points. Um, the first point, I completely agree that we Africa does not necessarily have um, um, uh, a rules crisis, in other words, in terms of the rules, uh, in terms of uh, the policies, in terms of the laws. But when we talk about labor migration, uh, there are some gaps. And when we talk about um, uh, a, a continental coherence, there is also some gap. Uh, the uh, African Protocol on Free Movement, uh, the establishing the Lunar Economies of, of, of a Free Movement, Residents, and uh, Establishment. We've just talked about it that it has only four ratification uh, from 54. That is a challenge. And uh, we are saying that there are quite a number of countries that have progressive laws at the national level. Ordinarily, these countries shouldn't have problem ratifying. Let's encourage these countries to do so, uh, to quickly ratify. And we are saying to be able to sp uh, speed every member up to date, there are websites, there are available spaces for us to be able to do that. And I'm happy about the, issue, the request for further engagement with the presenters. And we are ready for us as Africans, that is all we can do to uh, support this very uh, important structure. Uh, to do its work well. Secondly, I want to make the point that that the issue of um, the issue of uh, 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 application is is as important, if not even more important, than anything. The issue of application, and that is where uh, we actually see the crisis also of the of uh, the, the the governance uh, uh, issue. And this is what we see first. Let's see how we can improve the application of our laws amongst ourselves as Africans. And then we say if we protect it, because we have noticed that quite a number of our African government are interested in sending our citizens, our nationals, outside the shores of our countries to work. And uh, we celebrate that as employment creation, which is correct, but we don't follow it up with corresponding protection for these migrant workers. And that is why we see a number of cases of our nationals, uh, especially in the Middle East, quite a number of them return in coffins, quite a number of them are, 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 are abused, and then our government cannot effectively protect them, including our embassies. Let's see how much more we can work uh, far uh, better on the protection of uh, uh, our, our nationals. Yes, uh, continental movement, and the benefit of it for Africa cannot be overemphasized. And this is why we say, uh, with the comrades asking, why can't we move uh, freely on our continent to work and to share skills and to do all of that? We say, can we have much of it? Where are the gaps in terms of the skills on the continent? And then how do we build the, the skills so that uh, we can uh, do them more? And this is why we talk about whole of state approach all of states, Ministry of Labor, working with the Ministry of Education, working with the Ministry of Internal Affairs, working with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, together saying what do we have. In other words, our curriculum is developed to so that when people take certificate from South Africa, they go to uh, Burkina Faso, that certificate is recognized on the basis of standardization, on the basis of that qualification that has been noted. And when there are gaps in terms of the skill in South Africa. How can we get people from Burkina Faso to readily come there to work without being harassed? You know, we can do this amongst ourselves. And when we do this far better with ourselves, then engaging with those outside our continent becomes far more.
and for us. And I, I leave the last point that I need African Union of Geography to the African Union. We will all do that. And that is the excellence at the top of our uh, engagement. I thank you, Chair. And I thank you for the attention. Thank you for the wonderful. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to thank all the speakers. And I'd like to thank the Pan-African Parliament. Parliament that enabled us to have such an important workshop, such an important seminar. We all witness all this phenomena, all these uh, migrants that are mistreated, and so many people dying while uh, crossing the continent. And even in, on the social media, we see migrants that perish in the Mediterranean and in other seas. So these are important issues that we MPs have to take seriously. And we really need to move forward in terms of ratification, not only ratification of the instruments, because as you said, we can ratify the, the instruments and not implement them. So the work of any MP is to continue um, making advocacy and convincing, trying to convince the, the uh, member states to ratify, to sign, ratify, and but also implement um, these tools or these instruments on the field. Let me give the floor now to the chairperson of our session today. of um, the Committee on Justice and Human Rights for very good moderation of this session. And uh, thanks also to the two presenters. Kindly give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. We have been extremely patient, and I want to thank you for that. We are only left with one session, which will be very brief. And I would like to invite the, the deputy chairperson to guide us through the, uh, the draft uh, communique. Uh, I think it will take a very short time, and then thereafter we will ask the chairperson, chairperson of the Committee on Health to close the session. Honorable Vice Chairperson, you can come to the front. A very good afternoon to all. We have a document in front of us. My name is McHenry Venani. I am the Deputy Chair of the Committee of, on Trade, Customs and Immigration. We shall be very brief. In three minutes, we will be done. The one minute, I want to preface a saying that was said by a person during the genocide of, during the Holocaust in Germany that when they came for the socialist, I was not a socialist and I didn't do anything. When they, when they came for the Catholic, I was not a Catholic. I didn't do anything. And when they came for the Jew, I was not a Jew and I didn't do anything. And then they came for me, quote unquote. Many politicians across the region of Africa, because many of our countries are not affected by migration, so much by migration, Many parliamentarians treat this issue as a non-issue to us. But one day, one of ourselves, through economic or social or political circumstances, will find ourselves in a situation where we need proper migration laws for ourselves to be protected. So looking the other way and thinking that this is a West African problem, a North African problem, a problem of South Africa and not mine, would not be able to help us. Having said that, the joint communique is in front of you, very elaborate, but let's go to page, if there's any amendments to page one, page two, page three. I think the most important part is page three on the recommendations, and this is where I want to speed up. The meeting agreed to strengthen protection and promotion of the rights of migrant workers through collaborative measures and strategies and to continue to promote the mainstreaming of labor 
migration issues within the overall dialogue on migration at national, regional, and continental levels, including working together. One, to facilitate advocacy and capacity building of pub, regional, and national parliaments and labor migration, and I think that's very important. To disseminate, two, to disseminate and popularize AU economic, regional economic bodies and international legal instruments on labor migration and mobility. Three, enhance existing collaborations and lobby other key stakeholders to advocate for ratification and domestication of relevant legal instruments. And I think parliamentarians should also play a greater role at domestication of these laws. Gather information to be able to monitor and evaluate the status of ratification and implementation of relevant legal instruments by member states. Promote, support the ratification of international human rights and labor standards as per the annexure, hearing and domestication of these standards in national law and policy in member states. Again, members of parliament are the ones that are lawmakers and the absence of these laws question the seriousness of members of parliament to implement them. Five, champion key AU and regional economic blocks and international legal instruments on labor migration and mobility towards member states. The meeting encouraged member states to, important to ratify and adopt relevant human rights, labor and other international and regional legal instruments related to labor, labor migration, revise and enforce implementation thereof at the national level and share good practices and approaches to develop human rights based and gender responsive laws, policies and strategies co conclude interstate agreements, including bilater bilateral labor agreements when necessary, which would govern and facilitate safe, dignified and regular migration, including labor migration. Strengthen the capacities of the labor migration policies makers, administrators and institutions on international labor standards, decent work skills and qualifications recognition, social protection and promoting regular pathways through efficient labor migration governance. Those are the key important recommendations. Are there any other additions that we want to bring to the recommendations so that we conclude this important communique? Going once, going twice. Yes, Honorable two important members here. Yeah. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I think that this, since this is the communique related to the uh, entire discussion, I think that in the resolutions and re or recommendations, we also called upon the African Union Commission to involve the Pan-African Parliament in crafting the various protocols and the other tools. Maybe we can incorporate this idea as well in this communique. Thank you. That's a very good suggestion. But number one says we must facilitate advocacy and capacity building of PAP. So I think that encapsulates your position that we, we need to play a bigger role. Because if we build capacity at PAP level, we can be able to build a bigger role going forward. But we could include that. I'm, I'm, I'm very amenable to your proposal. Madam? Uh, I suggest that we include uh, uh, best practice in some countries, and uh, uh, so we can highlight the best practice and how other countries can follow. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Merci, Mr. President. Thank you, Chair. I think it's rather a typo I'm referring to here. Uh, it's paragraph three in the French version. Uh, Roman numeral four, gather information to be able to monitor and evaluate the status of ratification. We're speaking about ratifying an, an illegal instrument, so I think there's a, a repetition in French. Thank you. Out of that type and make a correction. Very good. Madam? Honorable Masondo, your neighbor, she wanted to say something. Yes. yes. I said already. <laughs> Thank you. Honorable Tongaribi, Tongaribi, 
Mr. Chairman, uh, Honorable Chairman, my, I don't know how you can put, craft that one, but uh, I'm thinking if we can have in our recommendation something that talks to us taking the issue of migration to the grassroots of Africa so that people can understand what migration is, what it entails, what are the challenges, what are the advantages of people moving across borders, how we can bring it to the last person in our, in our society. It, it, it may be very important. Thank you. Okay, that's advocacy. I think advocacy take care of that, that we must create a much robust advocacy on the continent. But I hear you. My brother from Zambia. Yeah. Um, I think earlier on in the discussions, I raised the uh, point that um, the AU must come up with um, uh, a mechanism that would be able to uh, make the uh, countries that are not taking these protocols uh, seriously uh, to be able to uh, account to the AU and give reasons as to why they are not uh, domesticating uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, protocols. I think it is important, otherwise uh, we'll be talking about the same thing over and over again. Noted. Honorable Masondo, uh, we said three yes. minutes, we said three minutes, yes. we are over, yes. with, we are at seven now. No, I'll try to be very, very brief, uh, Chairperson. Uh, I think, I think we, we do need to say uh, in as practical a manner as, as possible uh, that we must learn from international experience uh, and embrace the reality of migration as part of, of human existence. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, there are many practical examples that, examples that have been already been given in, 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 this, in this meeting, uh, really indicating that uh, uh, migration continues is one of those realities that we have con to contend with. But I'm just saying that it may be very useful just to emphasize it in our communique as we move in a direction uh, uh, that uh, Honorable Togarek seems to be, to be suggesting, that, that this must be integrated at a local, local level. Because uh, when all is said and done, nobody stays at a place called international or, or continental. Uh, finally, finally, the issue is at a local level. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Secretariat is noting that. Any other amendments or additions? Going once, going twice, shall we adopt this communique with amendments? Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Vice Chairperson for the Committee on Trade, Customs and Immigration. Mata, thank you so much for moderating that session and we will continue improving on the draft communique as stated. So right now we'll invite the chairperson of the Pan-African Parliament Committee on Health to close the session. Honorable Jean Patrice Franco Killen. Merci de me donner la parole. Chair, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, distinguished invited guests, allow me to begin by thanking the presenters today for the high quality of their presentations. We have been edified on the issues of migration and we've understood our role as parliamentarians to limit the migration of labor on the continent. And with that, I would like to express my thanks to my colleagues, the members of parliament for their commitment uh, every time a need has been expressed, which is for the good of our people, they have been here. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank the staff of the Pan-African Parliament and the staff from the organs of the African Union who have spared no effort to provide their full support and 
uh, draw on their experience for our benefit. We have all been subject to massive migration in, on our continent. We've seen the situation continues to evolve, and it has led to instability to, for many of our people as they seek a better livelihood. And so we have seen the challenges. We've been discussing them. So now, in order to implement our protocol, we need collaboration of all the stakeholders. If we want to realize the objective set by Agenda 2063 as to the integration of our continent, the respect of human rights must be at the center of all our discussions. So let me thank you all and adjourn this meeting and wish you bon appetit. Thank you much, uh, Chairperson, uh, Committee on Health, for the closure of this session. Let me kindly invite you to take uh, a photo at the front. A protocol will organize. And then uh, we, will also, we have also been invited for lunch at the restaurant. I think you've been given coupons. Uh, so thank you so much. So we'll have our, our Vice Presidents coming at the front, then the committee chairs, and then the rest.